steps that are going to take us, you know, to the moon and to Mars. And, and then at the same time, we're using the space station as, a, as an orbiting laboratory. So every day you do research that you couldn't be doing on the ground. You have to prepare for the spacewalks. You always prepare it very meticulously, very thoroughly. And then once you go out and just your adrenaline is, is very high. And it's also physically challenging because you're going to be for six, seven hours fighting against that spacesuit because that spacesuit is inflated with air for you to be able to breathe, which means it's going to resist your, your movements. So those are huge, big memories that you have, but, but really also sometimes the small things like the, the fun that you could have. It's one of the big achievements of the space program is to, is to bring people together. That's what makes us go, you know, in the future, I think our programs are going to be more and more ambitious. So we're going to need more than just one country. No single country in the world can do it on its own. So I think it's the partnership that takes us forward. Um, it, it makes you better, it makes you achieve more. And I think that's the path we're in. The space station has paved the way I and mean, every future big space program is going to have to follow the same path. So there we can see Shane and Megan have made their way up the tower. They're now they're now climbing the stairs to the level where the crew arm is located. Uh, before Aki and Toma make their way to the elevator at the ground level of Pad 39A, let's get a look at mission specialist and JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide. Once at the space station, he will be part of the first ever direct handover from one Japanese astronaut to another. I meant to check this, but do you remember, do you know when I was selected as an astronaut? 1999, thank you. I always get mixed up here. So I was born in Tokyo, Japan, and then from age three to seven, I actually lived in New Jersey because of my dad's job. In high school, I went to Singapore for two years. Went to Keio University in Japan got my uh, degree in mechanical engineering. And then right after college, I joined the uh, Japanese Space Agency. I have uh, dreamt of becoming an astronaut since my childhood and tried a couple of times in uh, astronaut selection. And on my third try, got selected as an astronaut candidate in uh, 1999. Saw so my first mission on uh, SDS-124 on the Space Shuttle Discovery. That was my first flight, so I thought I would be nervous, but my crewmates were already like my family, so we were just chit-chatting inside the cockpit. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of Shuttle Discovery. heading for a half year on the International Space Station. My second flight was a long duration flight. We launched on a Soyuz capsule, got to the space station and did a lot of science and spacewalks. Flying on a three different vehicles, that's, that's gonna be amazing. The new spacecraft, uh, Crew Dragon, it's a, it's a new technology, a new layout, new operation and I can't wait to actually experience it. So I guess the difference would be, it's a brand new vehicle, a lot less switches. It's like a smartphone, I would say, uh, which felt uncomfortable initially, because as an astronaut, you're like, where are the switches? Which button do I have to push? So initially I felt a little, I would say a little awkward. Then after training, um, you get adjusted and you understand, hey, this is how the system works and uh, how can I, as a crew member, help out the mission. It's a privilege, actually, to work together with these people and uh, look forward to actually doing the mission and uh, spending more time working together. I'm Aki Hoshide, JAXA astronaut and mission specialist for NASA SpaceX Crew-2 mission. Right, that was a look at uh, Aki Hoshide, and we can see the astronauts inside the crew access arm 
that walkway, here are uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough and Pilot Megan MacArthur. Uh, making their way up behind them are uh, ESA astronaut Toma Pesquet and JAXA astronaut uh, Aki Hoshide. And we'll be seeing them uh, make their way up. There they are coming up the steps. And they'll be uh, stopping to use the phone. Shane and Megan uh, already had the opportunity to do that. That phone is uh, up where you see uh, the person in the black suit that looks like Jessica Mir, number 38, part of the uh, closeout team at the pad. And this is a shot inside the white room, astronaut Shane Kimbrough to the left of your screen and to the right you can see the side hatch of the Crew Dragon Endeavor is open um, in preparation for the next milestone, which will be a uh, crew ingress in just a few minutes. If you're just joining us, you're watching live coverage of NASA's SpaceX mission known as Crew 2. Good morning and welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Marie Lewis with NASA Communications. And I'm Kate Tice, Senior Certification Engineer at SpaceX. Joining us today is NASA astronaut Tracy Caldwell Dyson. Welcome, Tracy. We're so happy that you're able to join us this morning. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Marie. It's great to be here. So as you can see, the crew has already arrived at Pad 39A, where Falcon 9 will lift off at 5.49 a.m. Eastern Time. We can see that Megan and Shane are in the white room here, undergoing final checkouts and uh, just comfort checks with the suit and closeout team. Uh, one thing that we'll see them do momentarily is the closeout lead there on the right-hand side with the tablet will provide them with a black Sharpie and they're going to actually add their signature to the wall to their right of this white room. Uh, we named it the White Room to keep, again, in space tradition um, from, you know, previous human spaceflight programs, but uh, something different this time where we're actually having all the astronauts that fly on Crew Dragon sign their names. And there's a shot um, inside the crew tower, it looks like, where Aki and Toma are now using the telephone to, for a final goodbye. Now, Tracy, do you want to talk a little bit about the significance of that particular telephone? <laughs> I, well, I, I think um, it's a great way to surprise your family and friends on launch day. <laughs> I know that my uh, my parents were not expecting it, and um, and it was probably one of one of the more emotional moments for them. And in a moment, uh, we will see Commander Shane Kimbrough. Here he is climbing inside. Crew Dragon Endeavor. We call this process ingress. And pilot Megan MacArthur following. So we can see the closeout team assisting the crew. Crew as ingress has started on schedule. Announcement there that we are on schedule with our activity here of crew ingress. Um, like I was saying, the you can see the closeout team assisting the crew as they enter the capsule to assure that they don't ding their helmet or any part of their suit um, on the hatch as they're entering. There's also some protective coverings around the hatch itself, but just to make sure that there's um, a clear path to entry, um, we see we now see suit technicians um, assisting the crew getting settled and uh, will help the, the crew members get buckled in. Uh, the, the, the harness that we see coming into the picture here is uh, not just your normal seat belt, <laughs> although it does function in, in that purpose. It's a, it's a five-point five harness, and uh, the crew will start to buckle themselves in. And kind of like when you get on a roller coaster, like you, you get your initial fit up, and then your, your safety team member comes over and makes sure that you're locked and loaded and ready to go. This is a great shot because we can actually see the, the touch screen, the LCD display screens above the crew. It, they might look in an awkward position right now. That's just because the seats are actually in a rot rotated downward for crew ingress uh, after everyone is, in is all buckled in and the communications and leak checks have been performed. The seats will rotate back so that the crew has easier access to those display screens. Um, but in addition to those display screens, they also have a tablet uh, either on their side, um, you might see some of the crew members have it Velcroed on their on one of their legs, 
and uh, they're also able to follow along with what's going on in the action using those tablets. And again, we see uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough in the foreground of your screen. This is a shot uh, from inside the Crew Dragon Endeavor. Pilot Megan MacArthur sitting to his right. And momentarily, we will see uh, ESA astronaut Toma Pesquet, who's on the phone right now, and JAXA astronaut Aki Hoshide in the background, uh, ingressing Dragon. And so we're going to go over to Hawthorne, California for our NASA and SpaceX friends there uh, to take us through the rest of this action. Gary, Jesse. Hey, Marie, great to be with you here from uh, SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. We're following along on all the action going on over at the Cape from here in California, the SpaceX uh, flight control team monitoring uh, the progress as the crew is ingress. Again, we're right now we're watching crew ingressing the, jab, the Dragon capsule, which is just a space flight term for climbing aboard. You'll hear a lot of these space terms in the coming hours and days. Ingress is just what we use when crew members are getting into a spacecraft or an airlock, while egress means the opposite. They're exiting. Before climbing into the capsule today, the crew completed a foreign object debris check or FOD check. That means they themselves have to be inspected for any substance or debris that isn't supposed to be on them or their suits, which could potentially cause damage to Dragon. In fact, we also heard an informal comm check. We heard the voices of Shane Kimbrough and Meg MacArthur in the seats right now. They'll do a more formal poll as we get later into the ingress procedures. And we got some really cool views of the second two astronauts walking through the crew arm, making their way to the Dragon capsule. And to protect, to help protect against debris, the crew has covers on their boots as well as on their umbilical port on their suits that need to be removed before they can ingress. And once the FOD check was complete uh, for the first two astronauts, uh, Commander Shane Kimbrough ingressed first, followed by Megan. And then next up, we will have Aki and Toma, who just made it to the white room that you can see on your left-hand screen. And Megan and uh, Commander Shane uh, Kimbrough are now strapped in. They're getting uh, all hooked up to their umbilicals, and the umbilicals allow the crew to have their comms through their suit, air to help keep them cool, as well as delivers nitrox for suit pressurization. And as we mentioned earlier in the broadcast, the suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. Now, there are four seats configured right now inside Dragon. They're numbered one to four from right to left. When you're looking at the seats, you can see Shane Kimbrough now positioned in seat two or the commander seat, Megan MacArthur, uh, beside him now in seat three, which for Crew Dragon is the pilot seat. Aki Hoshide will take the seat uh, number one, which is on the far right of your screen, and it's the left seat. Tama Piske will be in seat four, the left of your screen. That's called the right seat. Now, it's worth noting that Megan is sitting in the same seat in the same capsule that her husband Bob Bankin sat in during the Demo-2 test flight to the space station last year. Directly in front of the crew members, you can see sort of to the top of the panel that's on the right there, there are three displays that they'll use throughout the flight, getting insight into Dragon systems, seeing any alerts or issues with the vehicle, and if required, taking control and manually flying Dragon. Now coming up, the crew will do a comm check, and Megan and Shane Kimbrough actually did an unofficial um, or informal comm check, but there will be a formal comm check uh, once all four astronauts are in their seats. Um, and that is to make sure that they can hear mission control, uh, hear uh, mission control in Hawthorne, and then their seats will be rotated into position for launch once those comm checks are complete. So what you're seeing right now is, I believe that is Aki ingressing the vehicle. On the far end, it looks to be Toma. Toma's taking Toma? the right seat, the left uh, from, if you're looking directly through the side hatch, uh, but it is, it is the right seat. He and Aki both have the same role as mission specialists. They're just far enough away where they don't necessarily have access to that display panel. Uh, that Kimbrough and MacArthur will use as soon as the seats rotate. Mission specialist two from the capsule, come check. Hey, the new hot dragon, Toma, got you loud and clear. How many? I got you loud and clear, Chad. Thanks a lot. Good to be here. 
I love how fast that happens, Jesse, <laughs> as soon as they get into the seat. They do have those umbilicals that they were carrying that was providing air, uh, some conditioned air uh, to, to their suits, uh, and, and as, uh, was able to uh, pressurize it while, when they were in the ONC building. Uh, those suits will provide pressure to, um, to the suits when, uh, when that comes uh, later in the countdown. First is the comm check. So yeah, Toma plugged that in and, and that's that informal comm check. They're going to do a formal poll with all the uh, launch uh, support teams as well as the mission control teams here in Hawthorne, California. Aki Hoshide entering through the side hatch now. Yeah, definitely very exciting, Gary. This is one of my favorite parts is watching them ingress onto the vehicle. Um, it's really getting real. You know, we have been watching them since the suit up room, but now they are officially on the vehicle, getting strapped in, getting ready for this. MS1, check in. Aki, Doragoni, yo koso. Welcome to Dragon. Good to be here. Very cool. We just heard Aki's informal comm check. Again, once they are all strapped in, all their umbilicals are hooked up, uh, their harnesses on, then they will do an official comm check. And followed by that official comm check will be the seat rotation. And you can kind of see on your right-hand screen, the seats are uh, rotated upright right now. Uh, but when uh, they're getting ready for launch, they will rotate upwards uh, looking at your screen so that they can access those display panels that are right above them. That's right. Accessing those display panels will be key. In fact, some of the previous missions that we've watched, uh, Demo 2 as well as Crew 1, it was seconds before. I think the suit, the seat rotation was still actually rotating when the commander <laughs> and pilot pulled up their fingers and started pressing. They have a lot of procedures that they got to get through, make sure that they're, yes, you can see already <laughs> shaking, we're already, already accessing the panel. Um, yeah, th those checklists are some of the things from the crew side that they'll have to do. Again, some of those key visual milestones. Well, first are the audio milestones. We'll do the formal uh, communications check with all the ground teams, making sure everyone can check in through the various communication pathways that we have. On Dragon, there's uh, th some communication lines through the ground. We also have communication through ground stations, as well as TDRS geosynchronous satellite. So they'll test all of these different pathways, making sure that the crew can hear and uh, all systems are go before they begin those next couple of milestones. Jesse, you mentioned the seat rotation. That's a very visual milestone, as well as the uh, leak checks. We saw that again in the ONC building uh, not too long ago, but they'll do another one here uh, before they uh, the advanced teams that are there now that are uh, currently preparing the crew in their seats uh, before they go ahead and depart the access arm and leave the blast danger zone. Yeah, and as you mentioned, uh, they did perform those, those suit leak checks uh, while in the suit up room at the ONC building, but they'll do that again right before liftoff. And that's because, you know, they're strapped into a whole new system now. They're strapped into the Dragon system officially. Um, so we want to make sure that their suits are good for liftoff today. And again, we have all four astronauts on crew two sitting in each of their seats. These are custom seats uh, with their custom suits for each uh, astronaut. And it's almost like its own entire system. It's almost like they are inside of a uh, uh, a vehicle inside of a vehicle. <laughs> a spacecraft within a spacecraft, right. that's exactly right. That suit will hold pressure uh, just in case there is uh, any breach and that causes atmospheric pressure to decrease. They do have that redundancy with the suit itself providing pressure and holding uh, throughout some of the more dynamic phases of flight. That includes ascent. This is very important uh, until they reach an orbital insertion. It's not too long after they get into a healthy orbit. You got checkouts of the Draco uh, uh, engines that will provide the navigation and some of the thrust needed to make its way to the International Space Station, but it's really not too long uh, until they start doffing or taking off their suits uh, and, and getting into a position to get some shut-eye, actually, they get a long <laughs> flight ahead of them. Yeah, it's about a 23 and a half hour flight, um, so they will want to get comfortable. <sighs> You can see the suit techs are there helping all four astronauts get strapped in, preparing them for these suit leak checks and comm checks coming up here shortly. 
and you may have seen uh, some of them holding a tablet. That is so that they have access to those procedures. Each procedure uh, has very specific and intentional steps that they need to follow. Um, and the astronauts also have a tablet themselves that they can follow along those procedures. All right, two hours, uh, inside two hours and 34 minutes from launch, we're gonna stand by and wait for those communication checks. Meanwhile, uh, let's check in for an operational update with John Innsbrucker for the latest health on both vehicles. John. Well, as Gary said, just over two and a half hours remaining in the countdown for the launch of Falcon 9 with Dragon on the Crew 2 mission to the space station. The Dragon Launch Ops team has completed their major activities to prepare the spacecraft for the astronauts. Checkouts are completed of the major systems, including the escape system. And as you can see on your screens, ingress of the astronauts is well underway, all four crew members inside the Dragon capsule, and there are no issues in work. We're also listening right now for the Dragon team comm checks with the crew. That'll be coming up momentarily. Now the Falcon 9 team is located in firing room four in the launch control center at Kennedy Space Center. They're settling in for final checkouts and then propellant loading and launch We've been hearing some of the comm checks as the engineers get on station here in the last 15, 20 minutes. Now the Falcon 9 team will also do comm checks with the crew. That'll happen at about T minus two hours or about 30 minutes from now. Currently all systems are go on the launch vehicle. The range continues to report no problems. The weather forecast continues to be acceptable. We're looking at weather not only at the launch site, but around the world. We need to make sure conditions are acceptable if Dragon has to splash down in the Atlantic in case of an escape. We're also monitoring contingency splashdown locations if the crew had to come back to Earth before docking with the space station. Now, if this were to happen, SpaceX and NASA are coordinating with the US Coast Guard to ensure crew safety upon splashdown. That includes extra ships and air assets to patrol the 10 nautical mile keep out zone. This will help mitigate safety concerns for any boaters who may approach the landing area. But right now, as the clock continues to count down, all systems are go at T minus two hours, 31 minutes and 32 seconds. Let's head back over to Jesse and Gary who are also here in Hawthorne with me. Thanks, John. In order to get to where we are today, our third human space flight, it took years of hard work. The development of Crew Dragon really started with Cargo Dragon because Dragon was designed from the beginning for flying humans to space, so much so that even the first Cargo Dragon had a window. Our teams implemented a number of design upgrades to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are suitable for flying people and then put both vehicles through thousands of tests to prove their safety. At SpaceX, we believe in a process of continued iteration that allows us to continuously improve the designs of all of our hardware. Now, with that said, Dragon underwent a few improvements since it last flew people. That's right, Comp components have been added to the Dragon propulsion system that increases pad abort performance by over 10%, which increases launch availability by more than doubling the onshore wind limits. A fly around capability was also added, which will allow Dragon to circumnavigate around the International Space Station post undocking in order to take pictures and document the condition of the station. As you might recall, this was a maneuver the shuttle used to perform, but since its retirement, there hasn't been any spacecraft that has been able to provide detailed imagery around the space station. You could equate this to being able to walk around your house and check on it to make sure nothing is in need of repair. We've also added and improved some interior cargo stowage locations to make it easier for the crew to access items that they will need during free flight. And lastly, the paint on the mud flaps and Super Draco cartridges were changed from silver to white. While this may seem like an aesthetic change, it actually results in a lower equilibrium temperature on orbit for a given solar input. This has the advantage of increasing return availability by improving structural margins during splashdown. So a lot of preparation has come into ensuring the safety of these missions, and we're really excited to see Crew 2 lift off from the Kennedy Space Center later today. Still standing by for those communication checks. You can see uh, some of the suit technicians getting them situated. They become quite pros at this, Jesse. Just uh, <laughs> as soon as they got into the seats, you saw some of their gloves were off. Those gloves specially designed and form fitted to each of the astronaut. The gloves are now in place. 
Uh, very shortly, we'll be hearing the communications checks. Uh, some of the other milestones that'll happen very quickly uh, as well will be the seat rotation. It'll be from this position that allows the suit technicians to access each of the astronauts and help them get buckled, strapped in, uh, and the umbilicals checked out. Uh, and then of course, there'll be the suit uh, leak check. And we've got a cool view looking from outside of the Dragon capsule in through the hatchway. And some fist bumps there <laughs> <laughs> from the suit techs to the astronauts. It's an exciting day for, for everyone, really. The anticipation, I can't even imagine. You just, you, you want to, I, I, I just, uh, just knowing, seeing the pilots and the commanders from previous missions accessing the panel, wanting to get through their checklists. You know they're really soaking in this moment, but at the same time, they are thinking about those next steps. What do I have to do to prepare to make sure we're ready to launch on time today? Exactly. They must be so excited, but this is their job at the moment, right? right. They're actually... SpaceX Endeavor, we're in section one, decimal three, ready for comm checks. SpaceX copies, stand by for umbilical comm check. CDR, PLT, MS1, MS2, comm check. CDR, loud and clear. PLT, loud and clear. MS1, loud and clear. And MS2, loud and clear. And core, loud and clear. Umbilical comm checks complete. Stand by for ground station comm check. Just now joining us, they are performing comm checks right now. So that is what we are waiting for. They've done a couple so far. There will be a few more call outs here for these communication checks. Dragon SpaceX comm check. Endeavor has you loud and clear. And core loud and clear. Ground station comm check complete. Stand by for Teeter's comm check. An incredible view from one of the handheld cameras of the suit technician peering in through the side hatch. The side hatch will is open now and will remain closed throughout the duration of the mission until Dragon splashes down. We're standing by for some of the further communication Dragon checks. SpaceX, comm check. Endeavor has you loud and clear. Core loud and clear. Teeter's comm check complete. Stand by for comm checks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, MD on countdown one, comm check. MD, have you loud and clear on countdown one. MD, loud and clear, stand by for comm check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon to ground, comm check. MD, loud, loud and clear, Dragon to ground. MD loud and clear, stand by for comm checks with LD. Dragon, LD on countdown one, comm check. 
LD, loud and clear, countdown one. LD, loud and clear, stand by for a comm check over Dragon the Ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon the Ground, comm check. LD, loud and clear, Dragon the Ground. LD, loud and clear. And Dragon SpaceX launch configuration com checks complete. Report when ready for seat rotation per section two of four decimal one zero zero. All right, and you heard that call. The communications checks are complete from all the various communications. SpaceX Endeavor, we are ready for seat rotation. Copy. We'll report when initiating. Excellent. The communications checks are complete. The next step will be the uh, visual milestone of uh, seat rotation. So again, those communication checks were some, through some of the various paths of communication to Dragon, including uh, through some of the ground lines as well as ground stations. Dragon SpaceX initiating seat rotation. Copy. And you can see on your screen that seat rotation has now begun. They are rotating from upright to the recline launch position. And this will give Shane Kimbrough and Megan MacArthur access to those display panels right above them. And it's very slow and steady, but this is a pretty cool view that we have here on our An screen. An amazing <laughs> view, really. You can see how much uh, cargo space we have under those seats as well. Dragon SpaceX, seats are in the launch position. Copy, great news. And that seat rotation is now complete. You can already see them uh, getting their hands on that touch screen. <laughs> Dragon SpaceX, you are go for section three, suit leak check preparation. Copy, go for section three. These milestones really happening in rapid succession. As you mentioned, Jesse, it wasn't really too long until they reached <laughs> up and started touching through some of those procedures. That first one, of course, is the suit leak checks, communications checks complete from all the various communication paths and seats are rotated into the position for launch. Those seats specially designed for each astronaut. Uh, not only it allows them to access that display panel. Chair complete, ready for leak check. Copy Endeavor, we see the same. Your go for section four, suit leak check. Section four and work. And they've now begun those suit leak checks. So to catch up on the station side, let's check in with Courtney at Johnson Space Center. Courtney, how's it going? Thanks, Jesse. As we said earlier, the team here in Mission Control Houston is actively controlling and monitoring the space station as they await Dragon's arrival. The Expedition 65 crew is in the early part of their day after waking up at 1 a.m. Central Time. The crew on board have completed a number of tasks to prepare the station for Crew 2's arrival. NASA's Victor Glover received some additional onboard training for monitoring Dragon during its final approach, which he'll do from the station's cupola. In addition, he will set up computers and control panels needed for approach monitoring and hatch operations and pre-position emergency equipment. He will also work with Suichi Noguchi to get the extra station crew quarters ready for the new residents. Back here in Houston, our rotating flight directors and their teams will be in constant communication with the SpaceX mission director for the duration of the flight uphill. Once we get integrated operations, the NASA flight director will be conducting a series of go-no-go -no -go polls at the predetermined checkpoint 
points for Dragon's approach. For now, we'll continue to follow along from here in Mission Control Houston, so I'll send it back to the team at Kennedy. Over to you, Marie. All right, thank you, Courtney. Uh, if you're just joining us, it is T minus two hours, 18 minutes and counting until the first astronaut launch of the year from US soil and the third crew launch for SpaceX in NASA's commercial crew program. Commander Jane Kimbrough, pilot Megan MacArthur and mission specialists Thomas Pesquet and Aki Hoshide are strapped into their seats, rotated back and safely inside Crew Dragon Endeavor. The next milestones coming up are actually we just completed seat rotation and uh, we're going to have hatch closing coming up shortly. This will be the free, first reuse of Crew Dragon. This is the same capsule that flew Bob Bankin and Doug Hurley in SpaceX test flight to the space station last year. The crew today is also flying on the same Falcon 9 rocket booster that lifted the Crew 1 astronauts into orbit last fall. And we are also ready to see the first European astronaut fly in Crew Dragon. Of course, that's Thomas Pesquet. And NASA's Jasmine Hopkins is at a nearby viewing location uh, with a special guest from the European Space Agency. Jasmine? Thanks, Marie. Crew will be the first commercial crew mission to include two astronauts from our international partners. And good to talk Space to us more about it. It's Frank Devena, ESA's manager for the International Space Station. Copy, Program. we see the same. Good leak checks. Good uh, morning, good uh, afternoon in Europe. Thank you so much for being here today with us, Frank. We got some uh, call-ups happening over the waves right now. We're going to continue with your interview. Uh, so you understand the space station as both an astronaut and as a manager. Uh, you flew there twice. Can you tell us what today's mission means to ESA? Well, today is a very important mission, of course, for ESA. It's the first time that we fly an ESA astronaut in a U.S. commercial crew uh, vehicle, the Dragon, the, the Crew 2. Uh, and it's also the start uh, because uh, we fly Thomas Pesquet today on the Alpha mission, but uh, in fall we will fly Matthias Maurer and next year we will be back here uh, to fly Samantha Cristoforetti. So it's really a great time uh, for e ESA uh, to be on this mission. We have four USOS crew members now permanently on the International Space Station, which means that we have a big increase in the number of hours of crew time utilization that we can do. So we have a whole science uh, package uh, from ESA, but also from our partner agency, uh, CNES, that uh, will be executed during this uh, Alpha mission on board. So it's a great time to be here and we are very excited. Right, that is fantastic. And we are very excited. It's also an exciting time for ESA because you are going through astronaut selections as well. Can you talk to us about how ESA is planning to uh, expand the number of European astronauts on the space station? Yes, we are indeed uh, starting a new astronaut selection uh, this year. Uh, the campaign is running. We are asking uh, all people from around Europe to uh, participate and to put in their uh, candidacy uh, till the end of May. And then the selection process will take about a, a year. And then by the end of uh, next year, we hope to select a new class of astronauts that then will fly towards the International Space Station uh, as of 25, 26, something like that. And so we are also working with our international partners, of course, uh, like NASA, to extend the space station till 2030, because from an ESA point of view, it's very important that we continue the research and the technology development that we can do on the space station. Of course, science for the benefit of humankind here on Earth, but also to prepare for the future of exploration. As you know, ESA uh, is also a participant in the gateway. Uh, some of the astronauts will fly to the gateway as well. So we, we need to expand uh, our reach of uh, humankind in the, in the rest of the universe. Right, that's fantastic. You know, there's a lot of uh, great science that's going to be going on on board the space station, especially from Tomas Pesquet. You've spoken about the uh, European robotic arm previously. Can you tell us more about that and how he's going to be involved? Yes, also the 15th of July, we will see the launch of the MLM from Baikonur, uh, from our Russian uh, colleagues, uh, Roscosmos. And on this uh, multi-lab purpose module, there will be the European robotic arm. A robotic arm that has been uh, prepared long time ago, has been long time in storage, uh, be waiting for its launch. And now finally, we will be able to commission the European robotic arm uh, during the flight of uh, Thomas Pesquet. The first part of the commissioning, the second part will happen during the flight of uh, Matthias Mohr. And then hopefully we can start using this arm also to, uh, to enhance the capabilities of the space station on the Russian segment 
to place, for example, uh, experiments on the outside of the Russian segment or to relocate uh, some modules. So we are very excited as well to also work with our Russian colleagues of Roscosmos and Energia to get finally this uh, European uh, robotic arm launched to the space station. Right, right. No, that's very exciting. We're glad to see uh, some of the specifics of what he's going to be working on on board. Uh, can you tell us about the importance of our commercial and international partnerships with ESA? Well, it's very important uh, that we have this partnership uh, going, of course, uh, in the International Space Station. Uh, at one day, uh, the ISS will come to an end. Uh, but for sure, the partnership will continue. Uh, and that is already clear in the Gateway program now. And we hope to extend that further to the lunar surface with the astronaut, uh, with the Artemis program, and, and also have European astronauts uh, one day walking on the surface of the moon. So the partnership for us is extremely important to be able to execute our exploration program. Uh, but also the commercial partnership is very important because ESA wants to continue to fly astronauts to low Earth orbit even after the ISS. Uh, we want to be able to do research uh, in low Earth orbit after the ISS, do technology development that we will need for further exploration after the ISS. Uh, but most probably it will not be the same configuration anymore as we have today. It will be in a partnership with the commercial sector. Uh, it's what we call the LEO economy. And so one of the tasks uh, that we have as well at ESA is to help build this LEO economy so that we can also have a good and thriving future of astronautics, uh, flying astronauts, research and science in low Earth orbit after the ISS. Right, right. We have a lot to look forward to then from ESA. Frank Devena, thank you so much for being here with us today. Now we're going to take it back to the KSC host desk. All right, thanks, Jasmine. Uh, teams are running about 16 minutes ahead of schedule and hatch close will be happening momentarily. So we're gonna go over to John Insprucker and Hawthorne. John. Thanks, Marie. We are coming up on T minus two hours, 12 minutes and counting. Right now, the Falcon 9 team is on console in firing room four. They are preparing for their communication checks with the crew. That's due at about T minus one hour, 55 minutes. Now, SpaceX engineers right now, they're continuing to pressurize the launch vehicle gas storage bottles. These are composite overwrapped pressure vessels. They contain gases used to fill the tanks with hot helium as the propellant is drained out of the first and second stages. We're also storing helium and nitrogen gases on the vehicle. We use those to spin the Merlin engine turbo pumps when we start an engine in space. For example, when we light the second stage engine after it separates from the first stage. We're also using gas for attitude control systems. Both the first and second stages of the Falcon 9 have an ACS system. And finally, the landing systems use the gas to help with the grid fins and then deploying the legs right before touchdown on the drone ship. Now, currently for Falcon 9, the countdown is proceeding nominally at this point. On board the Dragon spacecraft Endeavor, we heard the comm checks just a little while ago between Dragon team and crew. We've seen the astronauts rotate their seats to the flight position. We've successfully completed the suit leak checks, and we're watching right now as the hatch is coming down as part of the closure uh, sequence of events. And then once we get the hatch closed, the SpaceX support team will perform a final leak check of that hatch. Now, once that leak check is finished and it passes, the team will then begin the steps to ready the access arm for retraction. Once they've got everything configured, the team will leave the pad by T minus one hour at the latest. Now, T minus two hours coming up here very shortly, Kennedy Space Center personnel will begin final sweeps of the flight caution and hazard areas. Right now, the only people that are inside the roadblocks in a perimeter around pad 39A are the crew and the SpaceX support team that you see on your monitor. And right now, as we get ready to bring the hatch down, we're gonna go back to the team at Kennedy Space Center. Thanks for that update, John. As you can see, we are preparing for the closure of the side hatch. The closeout team there in the black SpaceX flight suits that you see have performed a final FOD check and they've gotten the final okay from the crew inside the capsule to confirm that they are indeed ready to go to space today. As you can see, the side hatch has just been closed. This is 
a little bit more complicated than it may seem. So it's this initial closure, and then there will be uh, actual mechanical closure using a torque wrench, which we should see here momentarily. It might be, yeah, we can see that happening now. Um, and then afterward, we will inflate the seal that's around the side hatch in order to do that leak check. We'll, we'll inflate the seal, apply a pressure basically, and make sure that the hatch is able to hold that designated pressure for a couple of minutes. And once that's done, we'll put the side closure there on the open part of the hatch that still remains. And like John said, at that point, the crew will then begin to prepare the crew access arm for retraction. And I can't emphasize this enough. We've we've seen this time and time again um, with SpaceX. The written timeline, you know, has very specific times laid out. But oftentimes, we we see that they're ahead of schedule, and that's certainly the case here. As Side hatch is closed and starting leak checks on schedule. Okay, so we heard uh, the announcement that the side hatch Copy, is closed. Thanks for the words, Chad. And leak checks are uh, beginning momentarily on the side hatch. Um, now, when I say that they're ahead of schedule, that does not mean the launch time is changing. Launch um, is instantaneous. That cannot change. That's holding for 5.49 and two seconds this morning, Eastern Daylight Time. Um, but when the teams work ahead, um, as they are in this case, um, if everything goes well with the side hatch uh, leak checks, all that does is give them more time, more margin to troubleshoot if an issue does pop up after this point. Um, so they, they may be uh, running ahead of the timeline, uh, but regardless, we're still going to see launch, um, if everything goes well, at 5.49 at two seconds this morning. And what we're seeing now is the closeout team basically installing the fixture that will allow us to begin to inflate that seal that is around the side hatch, um, which, like I said, pressurizing and then um, for a couple of minutes to ensure that the side hatch is able to maintain that designated pressure. As you can see, everyone's following along with procedures on their tablets. Everyone has a specific job. That's what the numbers are for located on the back of the space suit, or excuse me, of the flight suits. Um, everyone has a specific role and all of this has been practiced multiple times, which is why it looks like the well-oiled machine that we see here. Stacy, at this point in time, the door is closed. You know stuff is happening on the outside. Where is your heart? Where is your head at this point in the launch countdown? Because you're you're not quite there yet, but like you said earlier, your suit's on, so like the on button has been pushed. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And and right now, I imagine um, I've not been in the the Dragon capsule, but I'm pretty sure the crew can hear what the closer uh, crew is doing right now. So um, they uh, they're probably listening to uh, the mechanisms and uh, their spacecraft breathing. Um, but at this point, now that the hatch is closed. They, it's it's like a new phase. It's it's just the four of you, and you know from this point forward um, that it's just the four of you. So your your focus kind of comes in a little bit um, before you're you're coordinating with uh, with the second team. But now it's just the four of you, um, and then the voices that you hear. So it's it's kind of a new it's a transition. <laughs> We got word that uh, the crew aboard the International Space Station is also watching all of this unfold live. Of course, they were sitting in uh, these seats at the pad in their Crew Dragon Resilience that's currently docked uh, to the International Space Station. So that crew is uh, watching the crew on the pad today and getting ready to welcome them aboard uh, if all goes as planned early tomorrow morning. And again, if you're just joining us, uh, the side hatch of the Crew Dragon Endeavor on the launch pad uh, has just closed and leak checks of that side hatch are in progress. This is a view of the white room uh, with members of the SpaceX pad closeout team you see in the black flight suits. And the shot we saw just before this was from inside the Crew Dragon Endeavor capsule. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not as simple as just closing the door on your car or to your house. Uh, we do inflate the seal around the side hatch. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> playing rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> Double-fisted rock, paper, scissors. What's the prize? What's the That's wager? what I want to know. <laughs> I know. What's the what's end game here? Yeah, what's at stake? <laughs> 
So, uh, like I said, this is this process takes a couple of minutes. We inflate the seal around the side hatch and uh, make sure that it's able to maintain that pressure for a couple of minutes prior to actually um, performing the rest of the physical preparation of the side hatch itself. Which at that point, after the successful leak, leak check, will mostly just involve removing the remaining uh, ground support equipment away from the area and installing the, the, the tiny hatch on the hatch. The rock, paper, scissors shoot with the crew two crew continues on. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, let's get back to the technical part of the rock, paper, scissor. Um, <laughs> they did this during dry dress, and we wondered what, what was going on. And it may be that they're just making up for lost time. I don't remember seeing them do this during uh, the suit up. And so they're they're getting in their rock, paper, scissor, scissor yeah, now. It's critical. It's totally critical. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I, I think that. You know, when we see the joke, uh, that we see the crew kind of joke around and have those moments of levity, they can do that because they they know these procedures like the back of their hand. Exactly. It's all like muscle memory at this point because they've rehearsed it so many times. Yeah, this is definitely a good sign. They, uh, uh, they have a moment of levity. So it's T minus two hours, two minutes and counting. Uh, the hatch close, uh, the hatch close has been completed a little bit ahead of schedule and we're awaiting the results of a side hatch leak check to make sure they can uh, proceed. I'd love to know what the winner gets in this rock, paper, scissors game that we see. <laughs> This will be probably a question, uh, the first opportunity. They have to answer questions after this. I just have to be looking at the uh, the crew's schedule on board right now. Um, and my memory of, of those days being on board, waiting for a crew to come up to see you. It's um, it's 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 a lot of anticipation because um, you're gonna, they're coming to see you. And mm -hmm. so I'm just thinking about um, uh, Mike and, and Shannon and, and uh, Victor and Suichi, uh, Mark on board, at least in the U.S. segment, to um, to be anticipating this. And they just got their day started, and I see a lot of flexible activities. And so uh, they're probably um, getting updates from Mission Control right now. We have time to take a couple of questions for social media while this uh, hatch leak check is in progress, if we could pull one of those up. Does food taste the same in space? Tracy, you're the only one here that can answer that. <laughs> I think that one's for me. Um, I would say that um, food probably tastes the same. It's your taste buds detecting it that, that um, go through a little uh, alteration. Um, for me, spicy foods took on a different flavor. Every astronaut's different, so um, you'll get a different answer depending on who you ask. But uh, shrimp cocktail, loved it on the ground, could not tolerate it in orbit. But it's very interesting. Yeah, it was. It was disappointing too because I really <laughs> yeah. liked it and I packed a lot <laughs> for that flight. Bummer. Yeah. Uh, next question. Are the big touch screens uh, that the astronauts are looking at just for looking up data and docking on the International Space Station or can, could the astronauts do something different with them like open the side hatch or separate the trunk or fire the Draco thrusters manually? Kate. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I the the screens are primarily used for monitoring, um, especially in the final approach to the station. Um, the everyone can actually see which thrusters are thrusting when as Dragon is uh, slowing itself down and steering and uh, uh, basically positioning itself to dock with the International Space Station. Um, but for the actions that are like like that were mentioned in the question there are actually a number of um, hardwired buttons located below the the screens there they're a little difficult to see um, so there are there are some commanding um, buttons that are located there uh, that would be used in, in in the event of an emergency I'm not quite sure what each and every button is but um, there are also actually a couple of buttons located on the left armrest you might be able to see it there um, just under Commander Shane Kimbrough's left arm, um, there there's actually a, a small control panel um, that allows them to basically turn the volume up and down, turns on their task light, which is the little personal light there inside the cabin. 
um, and of course transmit their communication. So there are a, a couple of different buttons located around um, the ones used most often are certainly there on, on the side of their arm. On uh, next question from social media. Why did the other Crew Dragon capsule have to undock and redock on a different space station port? What prevents Crew 2 simply from docking at that other port to avoid all the repositioning? Uh, so that's a great question, and I'm going to try to explain it in a simple way. So um, the shorter answer is the Crew Dragon resilience could dock to either the forward port or the Zenith port. Um, they're going to be docking to the forward port. That is where um, the Crew Dragon resilience, um, excuse me, I misspoke, the Crew Dragon Endeavor is what's on the pad and they can dock to either uh, the forward port or the Zenith port. The Crew Dragon resilience, which is already on station, uh, relocated from the forward port to the Zenith port uh, earlier this month. And that actually had more to do with the Cargo Dragon flight that's coming up this summer. Um, the preferred port for Cargo Dragon is the Zenith port. Um, so that keeps the Zenith port open uh, for the Cargo Dragon when Resilience uh, departs to come home in just a few days. Uh, so it's a little bit of musical chairs, a little bit of just rearranging parking spots on the International Space Station because it's a, it's pretty hopping up there. <laughs> what a great problem to have though. Too many dragons, we gotta move things around. <laughs> um, one thing that we did learn that came out of that activity, so in order to perform that, um, that port relocation. Side hatch leak check complete and access panel install has started. Okay, great information there. Sounds like that. Copy, thanks. Le uh, that leak check was successful and now they're going to install the final plate there on the side hatch. Um, so this is essentially the last buttoning, the last- Dragon SpaceX, we're commencing help check for the launch escape system. Expect a momentary flight computer change followed by transition back to pad hatch closed. Kathy, thanks for the heads up. As I was saying, this is the last physical buttoning up of the Dragon capsule. Um, the last, basically the the last bit of crossing the I's and or dotting the I's and crossing the T's <laughs> um, <laughs> that the vehicle itself will undergo prior to uh, liftoff. Um, and we can see the team working to finish uh, in, or uninstalling the hardware there. Uh, that was utilized for that leak check. And so we've got uh, a little over an hour now until the pad team wraps up its final checks and clears the white room. Uh, that's when the action will really pick up with the retraction of the crew access arm, the arming of the launch escape system, and propellant loading on the Falcon 9 rocket. So we'll keep a live view of the crew here as they're sitting tight for the next hour or so and provide you with some more context about this mission. Now let's head over to Houston for a closer look at what the crew will be doing once they reach their destination. Courtney? Thanks, Marie. Once Crew Dragon arrives at the International Space Station, they'll be welcomed by their Expedition 65 crewmates. We're doing something called a direct handover, which just means a new crew of astronauts arrives at the station before another crew departs. It will only last a few days, but we'll have 11 people on board the station. The record for the most astronauts aboard the station was set several times during the space shuttle program when we had as many as 13 for short periods of time. One question we've heard a lot is where are all of these astronauts astronauts going to sleep. The space station has seven permanent spots for astronauts to sleep known as crew quarters. When we have more people sleeping on the station than locations for a short period of time, Dragon the crew SpaceX. works with flight controllers on the ground, ground to complete. stake out temporary campout locations like in different modules. We can also have a crew member sleep inside each Dragon capsule as Crew 1 Commander Mike Hopkins did for his stay on the station. This mission will also continue keeping the long duration crew size on hey, station Dad, at seven the on the US side. Briefing. We'll have five astronauts to conduct research. Uh, Just the jump from to three to four astronauts takes our average of Dragon 30 to 40 Falcon hours of science work away ocean, from station, so all the way up to 80 launch. to 100 hours, effectively doubling our amount of time dedicated to uh, research. Great words on the With five aboard the during Thank Crew 2's mission, that number will reach even higher. As the station and is first and foremost a laboratory. Contracts with Falcon 9 operators. Ready for the contracts we'll with right Falcon 9 operators. Experiments. 
and with new research still to be delivered on upcoming cargo flights, including another SpaceX Dragon scheduled right now in June. That's the latest from here in Mission Control. I'll toss it over to Jasmine now, where we will learn more about some of the exciting science on the horizon for Crew 2. Jasmine? All right, we are uh, actually at the Kennedy uh, host desk at the Kennedy press site. We are currently at T minus one hour and 53 Dragon minutes. Dragon GNC on countdown one, comm check. GNC loud and clear, countdown one. GNC loud and clear, stand by for comm check by propulsion. Dragon prop on countdown one, comm check. Prop loud and clear, countdown one. Prop loud and clear, stand by for comm check with avionics engineer. Dragon avionics on countdown one, comm check. Avionics loud and clear, countdown one. Avionics loud and clear, stand by for comm check by ground segment engineer. Dragon ground segment and countdown one, comm check. Ground segment loud and clear, countdown one. Ground segment loud and clear, stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, comm check. Launch control, loud and clear, countdown one. Launch control, loud and clear, stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, CE on countdown one, comm check. CE loud and clear, countdown one. CE loud and clear, this completes the F9 responsible engineer comm checks. All right, so we just heard uh, comm checks from the Falcon 9 team and uh, the crew Dragon Endeavor crew uh, sitting inside the capsule. That was the voice of Chief Engineer Emma France that we last heard and uh, everything sounded great. We are going to go over now to Jasmine at uh, the OSB2 viewing location uh, with another special guest. Jasmine. Thanks, Marie. One of the ongoing experiments on the space station is growing plants in space. Here to talk to us more about it is Joya Massa, project scientist from right here at Kennedy Space Center. Thanks so much for being here, Joya. Oh, my pleasure, Jasmine. Thank you. Absolutely. So let's get right into it. Why are we growing plants in space? Well, we're growing plants in space for a number of reasons, uh, primarily for the food um, to help supplement the packaged diet. The packaged diet is great, but if it's stored for a long duration, like it will have to be when we send astronauts to Mars, the, the nutrition and the quality can break down. So we're looking at adding plants to provide all of the vitamins and variety for the crew. Um, at the same time, they're going to provide psychological benefit and that reminder of Earth. Right, right. No, that's that's really important to think about. Um, so growing plants can be difficult as it is on Earth. Not everybody has a green thumb. So what are some of the specific challenges that astronauts are facing growing plants on the space station? Well, you know, we have a number of challenges. I mean, one to think of is, is seeds. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I've got some seeds here to show. They're really small. So handling seeds, planting seeds is a real challenge. So one of the things we've recently tested in the space station was having the astronauts put seeds um, that are planted in a film and to plant the plants directly with that. So it's a way to handle the seeds easily in microgravity without them floating away. And they plant them in plant pillows, such as this that we use in our veggie chamber. Another challenge is watering the plants. And right now the astronauts have to water the pillow in veggie through this quick disconnect. Um, you know, it's a fair amount of labor and it's not as sustainable as we need to be in the future. So we're looking at methods like, uh, like this porous ceramic tube where plants could be grown multiple times, harvested, the tubes could be cleaned off and then replanted. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at a lot of these challenges to try to figure out solutions for the future. Right, right. it's good to see those creative solutions that we have uh, going on there. So this is a very uh, timely uh, scientific um, experiment going on on the space station because just yesterday we celebrated Earth Day. Uh, can you talk to us about how some of the science that we're doing on the space station is helping us here on our home planet of Earth? 
Certainly. You know, there's a lot of parallels between the agriculture that we do on Earth and the agriculture that we need to do in space. And we're learning a lot that may apply to growing plants on Earth, especially in controlled environments, how to grow plants indoors. So there's a lot of work on vertical farming in cities um, to grow fresh produce. A lot of the lessons that we're learning for how to care for the plants translate directly to that environment. And we also learn a lot from the research community on Earth working in that area. And even other aspects such as choosing the right plants to grow in these environments. Um, we do work on that here to identify good candidates that have the vitamins that, that people need, that have very good food safety, um, and those would also translate well to Earth. Also, the work on LED lighting for crops. That was something that NASA started originally and now it's being done all over the planet. Right, right. and I'm glad that you, you mentioned uh, choosing the right plant. I know that uh, part of your scientific research is also education-based um, with something called Growing Beyond Earth. You worked with students in hundreds of classrooms you know, across the country to help choose a crop that Mike Hopkins grew on the space station. And is there anything that you want to tell to those students you know, about the future of plant science? Well, that citizen science education program that we run um, is, is, well, it's run by Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden in Miami, and we collaborate with them on this. It's been wonderful because we have over 250 middle schools and high schools around the country helping us to do the research that we need. We have a pretty small group here at Kennedy Space Center, and so we need this, this army of young researchers helping us to decide which plants to, to grow in the future. So I just really want to thank those students for all their hard work on this. Um, encourage others who are interested in, in potentially getting involved in this program to look at citizen science on science.nasa.gov to learn more about the program and to encourage people to grow plants at home just because you learn so much when you're doing this type of research. Right, right, absolutely. There's a lot that our uh, future space gardeners have to look forward to. Mm -hmm. uh, Joy Amasa, Project Scientist, thank you so much for being here with us today. Our astronauts are doing a lot more than gardening on the space station, so we're going to take a closer look at this life-changing science and get a message from the last person to command a crew dragon into orbit. The International Space Station is a state-of-the-art microgravity laboratory that is unlocking discoveries not possible on Earth and helping us push farther into deep space. Every single day, we are answering big questions about Earth and about space, about where we came from and about where we're going. But the other thing that we're doing is we're learning more questions to ask. Microgravity turns almost everything we know upside down. Liquids behave completely differently. Fire burns in new ways. Biological systems reveal surprises. There's a few things that have made me gasp out loud up on board space station watching heart cells actually beat has been a pretty big one. We're studying ways to grow food in microgravity. I gotta tell you, these, uh, these are pretty amazing. We're learning how human bodies react to life in space and how to keep crew members safe and strong on long duration exploration missions. Deadlifts are awesome on Earth. They're also awesome in zero gravity. We're testing technologies that will be critical to our return to the moon and great leap to Mars. Our research has contributed to medical and social benefits on our home planet, allowing us to find new ways to combat disease back on Earth and develop technologies to deliver clean water to remote communities in need. The spectacular vantage point of more than 200 miles above our planet supports our monitoring of Earth's climate, natural disasters, and plant life. I can't begin to describe some of the sights that you get to see. It's just an incredible view of our planet that we have from here. The growing new space economy, so vital to our continued progress in space, is flourishing in low Earth orbit. We're inspiring future generations from a platform that is one of the largest international collaborations of our time. We're doing science at 17,500 miles per hour. Come along for the ride. Hi, I'm NASA astronaut Mike Hopkins aboard the International Space Station and a member of Expedition 64. 
Additionally, I have the honor of commanding Crew Dragon Resilience, which brought us here last fall. Since that time, my crewmates and I have been busy working on experiments and performing spacewalks to maintain this spectacular orbiting laboratory. It has been a privilege of a lifetime for the past six months as we continue to pave the way for exciting new exploration that will lead to American footprints on the moon once again in the near future. Victor, Shannon, Suichi, and I are getting ready to come home soon. But first, we're looking forward to welcoming the next SpaceX Dragon crew. Shane, Megan, Toma, Aki, you are about to experience one of the most exciting rides of your lives and a very memorable 24 hours to document with ISS. We've loved our time here, but we're ready to pass the baton to you for the next commercial crew mission on Dragon. Godspeed. All right, that was Colonel Mike Hopkins, commander of Crew Dragon Resilience. He's been up on the International Space Station since November of last year. He's had a chance to look down at the Earth and watch it breathe. Now, what does that mean? Well, luckily, we have a climate scientist here from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory to tell us everything about it, Dr. Anne-Marie Eldring. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me here. So, yeah, what do we mean by watching the Earth breathe? So, carbon dioxide in our Earth's atmosphere, you probably know it's going up as we burn coal, oil, gas, but it has this big seasonal cycle. So plants are really important for carbon dioxide. When they spring, they take it out of the atmosphere. And there's so many plants in the land of the Northern Hemisphere. Northern spring reduces the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In the fall and the winter, those leaves are falling off, decomposing. It goes back in and out of carbon dioxide from plant activity every year. All right, so why is the International Space Station a good place to monitor all of that? The International Space Station was actually really well designed for us to do science on it. And uh, two features we love. One is it, the way it orbits around the Earth, it passes overhead at different times of day. For like LA, you'll see it change during the week. And that's really interesting with plants and these other things that respond to sunlight, you want to see them at different times of day. You can sort of learn about that part of the change. So the uh, OCO3, Orbit Carbon Observatory 3, has been up on the International Space Station since 2019. It launched on a SpaceX Dragon. What have you seen so far? What sorts of data have you seen coming in? We've, we've been really having a great time making measurements. I brought my little plastic model of what we have loaded up there. And one of the things on the bottom, it has this pointing system and we can look everywhere very quickly. So I brought a graphic along that's a measurement over Los Angeles. We looked at carbon dioxide. In just two minutes, we mapped the city and you can see how there's extra carbon dioxide over the heart of LA as compared to the outer reaches. So we can start to see city scale variation in carbon dioxide and learn more about our own human emissions than we've ever seen before. Now that's some great data, right? But this is yeah. not the only remote sensing tool that's on the International Space Station. What else is up there? It's it's like a party up there. We've got, <laughs> especially when you're thinking about plants, we have a neighbor called Jedi. It's looking at how much plant material is there. There's another neighbor called EcoStress. It says, what happens to plants when they're hot and dried out? And then this other instrument from uh, the German Space Agency, DSIS, that's figuring out what types of plants are in different places. So when you get all those measurements from the ISS, same time, same place, really powerful for science. All right, Anne-Marie Eldering, thank you so much for joining us. Really uh, project scientist for Orbiting Carbon Observatory 3. Uh, we have a lot more of uh, climate science uh, information that you can find on our website. That's nasa.gov slash Earth Day. Now let's get back to the action with Crew 2 with John Innsbrucker here at SpaceX headquarters in, Wa in, uh, in Hawthorne, California. John? That's right, Gary, just upstairs from where you are down on the floor. We're coming up on just over 100 minutes before launch. The Falcon 9 launch team began their final activities at T minus two hours. Now, the launch engineers are located in firing room four in the NASA Launch Control Center on Kennedy Space Center. They've got a view through their large windows of pad 39A located just five kilometers east of where they're sitting. Now, the Falcon 9 team is loading helium and nitrogen gas into storage bottles on the launch vehicle. Radio frequency checkouts have also been completed and a final review of launch vehicle testing performed earlier today is underway. Now the SpaceX chief engineer will check with the team at T minus 80 minutes to verify we are good to continue the countdown. Now the next major activity is going to be flowing a small amount of fuel onto the first stage to prime the Merlin 1D engines for ignition. 
The team is also monitoring fuel and liquid oxygen loading preparations. We're ensuring that the propellants in the ground tanks are correctly chilled prior to loading onto the Falcon at T minus 35 minutes. Now the view you've got here, the Dragon capsule at the end of the crew access arm. Well, the crew's been busy uh, this early morning. We've got all four of the astronauts are in the capsule. The hatch is closed. The comm checks with the SpaceX launch team are complete, both with the Dragon flight crew, as well as the Falcon 9 launch crew. We've also done a leak check and that confirmed the hatch is correctly installed. It was completed with no leaks. Now at about T minus one hour, the support team will be clear of the crew access arm and the pad. And actually right now we're running well ahead of schedule. So they're beginning to button things up. And so they may actually leave the uh, launch pad area a little bit early. Now the range will begin their final sweeps of the flight hazard and caution areas. And for the weather, the good news right now is that everything continues to look good. The weather possibility of bad weather is only 5% right now. What we're mostly looking at is in case uh, a uh, cloud with uh, some rain in it pops up along the flight trajectory, but that doesn't look to be a big issue right now. We are waiting at T minus one hour for some last weather data that'll tell us uh, the Dragon weather conditions if they are go for launch in the case of an abort, we need to make sure that it's not too windy. If Dragon had to do an escape maneuver from the Falcon 9, we don't want the winds to be too high as they come down into the ocean. But right now, everything looks good, both at uh, the launch pad, as well as the downrange and uh, contingency weather, uh, contingency landing locations looking good weather-wise. So right now, everything's looking go at T minus one hour, 37 minutes, 28 seconds. And Jasmine, back to you in Florida. Thanks, John. This mission is demonstrating our partnerships across the country and around the globe. Joining me now is Hiroshi Sasaki, Vice President of JAXA and Director General of the Human Spaceflight Technology Directorate. Thank you so much for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Of course, of course. So Crew 2 will be the second commercial crew mission to include a JAXA astronaut. Can you tell us what the commercial crew program means to JAXA? Yeah, commercial crew uh, program is very uh, important for also us that uh, our Japanese astronauts on board. And Aki, as well as the Japanese folks, uh, is so excited that uh, uh, Japanese astronauts Soichi and Aki will meet each other in a space station. And it is a symbol of the Japanese astronauts are active in space. And the, it inspires and give hopes to the Japanese young people. Right, right, absolutely. So I'm glad that you mentioned that, that Aki uh, Hiko Hoshide will be joining Suichi Noguchi on board. And this will be the first time that there is a direct crew handover with two JAXA astronauts. Can you tell us how that's inspiring the next uh, generation of JAXA astronauts? Yeah, uh, now we are uh, selecting the new astronauts. Well, uh, not only the ISS, but all the moon uh, missions. And uh, it, uh, these activities are very inspires uh, people to want to go to the space and even the moon, I think. Right, right, absolutely. There's a lot of inspiration, of course, coming from the two of them. And like Soichi, Aki has had a lot of experience. Uh, he's flown on shuttle, Soyuz, and soon a crew dragon which is very exciting can you tell us um what unique skills he is bringing to crew two yeah he, he has a, a lot of experience and i think that he is uh, very relaxed to the lunch no uh maybe he uh, will lead the uh, other astronauts to the uh relax and a good uh mind i think so that he's relaxed today, but he's ready to go. We're all ready to, yeah. to watch him and cheer him on. So can you tell us what is next for JAXA and the commercial crew program? Yeah, uh, the next, uh, we, were up, uh, we already assigned uh, uh, Wakata, a very famous astronaut, mm -hmm. and also Urukawa, his uh, second flight. And uh, uh, we want to uh, send a Japanese astronaut every year. Mm -hmm. 
That, that's fantastic. We are, we're looking forward to that cadence of, of JAXA astronauts going to the space station. Uh, and you also mentioned the moon, you know, inspiring people to, to go back to the moon. So uh, last year, JAXA signed the Artemis Accords, which is uh, speaking to our continued partnership in space. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, uh, Japan is uh, signed not only the Artemis program, but also the Gateway MOU. And uh, we want to uh, contribute the, using our M M uh, expertise, uh, such as uh, aircraft system uh, or transportations, mm -hmm. and even astronauts. Right. right. And uh, we will want to uh, go together to the moon uh, with the international partners. Exactly. No, uh, you know, it, it's all about partnership. It's all about going together. Uh, is there anything that you can tell us that uh, Aki will be working on on station? Any specific science that he'll be doing? Yeah, uh, he will uh, conduct uh, lots of uh, science research mm -hmm. and technology demonstrate, such as uh, uh, protein crystal growth for the medicine uh, design, uh, contributing the uh, people on the ground. And a demonstration was a enhanced uh, water recovery system for the future explorations. Right, right. That is that's fantastic. We know yeah. that he's going to be doing great work, and I'm sure that you are excited to see today's launch. Can you tell us where you'll be watching from later on today? Yeah, I want to. I'm I'm looking for the. I've seen the beautiful launch. Fantastic, wonderful. Hiroshi Sasaki, thank you so much for joining us today. We are honored to have you here. And now we're going to take it back to Marie at the KSC host desk. All right, thank you, Jasmine. We are uh, currently at T minus one hour, 32 minutes and counting until Crew Dragon flies its next four person crew to the International Space Station with the astronauts you see live inside the Crew Dragon Endeavor spacecraft. Commander Shane Kimbrough, pilot Megan MacArthur, and mission specialists Toma Pesquet and Aki Hoshide. At this point in time, uh, we expect the closeout team to be given the go to leave the BDA, the blast danger area. Um, we're waiting to hear that call out. They're just doing final inspections. Um, so all good news uh, proceeding to an on-time liftoff this afternoon. Um, the uh, the milestone that will be coming up after that will be the um, launch escape system checks or LES checks. Uh, that will happen around T minus one hour and 30 minutes. Um, and those will be conducted by the Falcon launch team. Those checkouts are a standard part of the launch countdown and critical to make sure that everything is in working order before arming the launch escape system. And which of course, on there we see the closeout team leaving the Dragon capsule, walking down the crew access arm. So the closeout team has begun. Dragon SpaceX, departure. closeout team has departed the crew arm. Copy, thanks. We just heard confirmation that the pad closeout team has departed the crew access arm. As I was saying, the milestone that will be coming up next is uh, commencement of the launch escape system checks. Um, and we're expecting that to begin any moment now. Um, as I was saying, this is, these are standard part of the launch countdown, uh, critical to make sure that everything is in working order before we arm the launch escape system, which of course comes right before we uh, step into propellant loading. And that launch escape system is what uh, basically arms uh, the Crew Dragon capsule to be able to uh, propel itself off of the Falcon 9 rocket in the event of an emergency. And so that is a critical uh, step that has to be taken before the arming of that system uh, that happens just before fueling on the rocket begins at uh, T minus 35 minutes. Once again, seated in the seat that is closest to what we can actually see on the camera is Commander Shane Kimbrough. To his right is pilot Megan MacArthur. Uh, to her right is Toma Pesquet. And then seated underneath the camera, so unfortunately we can't see him, uh, is Aki Hoshide. 
this crew has certainly been having a good time while they're sitting in their seats. There's not a whole lot for them to do at this particular time. We see some smiles there on our commander. So it sounds like everything is, is uh, fun inside the capsule. Tracy, you mentioned earlier that this crew is just at, you know, the, the epitome of, um, of working together and just having these amazing personalities. And um, I can only imagine what it would might be like to be, of course, no flies in uh, Crew Dragon. That's that's for an object to breathe. That's fun. But to to be a fly on the wall and 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 kind of peek in on these interactions, it must be so fascinating. Yeah, if I had to guess, even though we can't see Aki, uh, we know he's smiling, right? <laughs> he's the one probably making them all laugh. Yeah. Um, yeah, these guys have worked together. We've all worked together well before um, being assigned to crew together. And these four have intertwined in a number of ways. Uh, as you know, Shane and Toma flew in space together on their expedition. Um, Aki um, credits Megan with teaching him how to Capcom. And um, <laughs> this is how you Capcom, how you Capcom Aki. And um, he told me that he gave me credit for giving him the opportunity to first um, make a Quindar. Uh, which is the uh, ping that you hear uh, when you have um, keyed the mic in mission control to space to ground or air to ground, or in this case, uh, dragon to ground. And um, I'll take it, you know, whatever um, contribution <laughs> I made to his fabulous career, <laughs> I'm, I'm very honored. Uh, but um, yeah, this, this crew is uh, um, top notch um, people um, at heart, as well as um, technically sound and brilliant and uh, all that they've done. So I can only imagine uh, them being concentrated together in a capsule. Mm -hmm. There's just too much goodness. The rest of us probably just wouldn't be able to fit in there. So it's great. And there's a look outside at the launch pad, uh, looking at the crew access arm extended out still connected at this point to the Crew Dragon Endeavor. That will um, retract from the capsule as we get closer to launch uh, around the T minus 42 minute mark. So again, we've, uh, we've just been standing by to listen to um, the launch escape system health checks. Um, we expected that to hear that about T minus uh, one hour and 30 minutes, but we haven't heard it just yet. Uh, let's take a social question while we're standing by for that. All right, how come some launches take longer to get to the space station than others? Tracy, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, I, it, it mainly, again, has to do with our orbital mechanics and, um, you know, the station, uh, uh, the the capsule when it launches is uh, constantly chasing the space station. Um, but it, it has a lot to do with... Um, phasing we call it but that's really just the the distance you are to the space and space station and and how far below it you are and you're catching up to it and it and um, we call it a profile but it's basically the path that the capsule takes to get to the station and um, each milestone of that is a is a engine firing that that takes it closer to the station either in altitude or, or in proximity and how that's designed um, have, plays a big role in how long it takes to get there. Plus, engines, uh, performance, and, and propellant, and um, a number of factors can go into that that make it um, anywhere from uh, two days uh, to, to two hours. And so it's quite a, um, a range of, uh, of time to get there. Mm -hmm. And it, it just so happens that uh, this flight, uh, after it lifts off at 5.49 at two seconds this morning, uh, we expect they will be docking to the International Space Station uh, in less than 24 hours, a little after 5 a.m. Eastern time, uh, Saturday morning. I think we have time for another social question. What improvement over Crew 1 does this mission have in terms of Crew Dragon itself? Also, will rendezvous with ISS be quicker this time or take the 27 hours like previous missions? Uh, I think we just answered the last part of that question, yeah. but Kate, do you want to take the first part? For sure. Um, yeah, we've definitely made a number of upgrades to Crew Dragon. Like I said before, this is a refurbished Dragon. This is the first time that we are utilizing a, a, a flight proven Dragon on a crew mission. Um, we installed some components on the Super Draco system, uh, which is actually, if needed, which of course, never something we expect to use, but um, the launch escape system, as we mentioned before, um, is an important safety feature. And the components that we added to that propulsion system 
uh, it gives us over a 10% improvement on, on performance uh, for a pad abort scenario, um, which in that case doubles, and in, th in this situation, doubling is a good thing. It actually doubles our, um, our envelope for the, the wind limits at, at launch time. So when there are so many things going into consideration for a launch, like downrange weather, which is why we waved off from yesterday, um, to launch weather uh, here specifically at the site, it's, it's um, a great improvement to be able to have um, twice as much capability there in that range. We've also improved some inside things. We've taken, of course, feedback from the, our astronauts that have, have flown on board already uh, and have taken their feedback and made some um, more efficiency or operational improvements to things even as simple as where certain personal items need to be packed inside Crew Dragon for retrieval while, uh, while on orbit. And I think we have time for uh, one more social question. Are the Crew 2 astronauts going to do any experiments that are related to Artemis missions? Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, in fact, many of the experiments on station are uh, directly related to Artemis. There's a live shot of the moon that we're looking at, by the way. Um, and that is where we're going with the Artemis mission uh, to put <laughs> We are set on putting the first woman and the first person of color on the moon as part of the Artemis mission. And the, the experiments that the astronauts do on the space station um, help us learn about how life in microgravity affects the human body. And of course that helps us develop uh, the technologies that we need to keep astronauts healthy for those longer deep space um, missions that are required to go to the moon and eventually onto Mars. And uh, one in particular, that Aki has mentioned is uh, working on recycling water in space um, and, and also ways to counteract bone and muscle loss from extended time in space. I mean, those are just a couple of, of examples, but there are so, uh, so many more. Um, also wanted to let folks know that we actually, um, we have completed the launch escape system health checks. Um, we, we, we didn't acknowledge them because they happened so far ahead of schedule. Um, we were expecting them at T minus one hour and 30 minutes. They in fact happened uh, more than 30 minutes ago. So just wanna let folks know uh, that we did uh, have those already happen and they were successful. This is of course the third crew to fly to orbit in a commercial spacecraft. Of course, the first were astronauts Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin uh, nearly a year ago. And the, la the last crew that launched in November is still in orbit right now. They are getting ready to return to earth on April 28th after they welcome the crew two astronauts aboard the space station. Here's a look at some of the extraordinary and record setting accomplishments of the crew one team to date. You know, it feels great to be a part of this transition, this transition from a test program, a demonstration program, to an operational program. After NASA certified Crew Dragon, Crew-1 is the first mission to the International Space Station. I feel very honored to be a part of this great mission. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. When we're sitting on the launch pad, I think what's going to be going through my mind is I want to be in the moment and enjoy the experience. There is just an electricity in the air as that countdown is happening, the engines light and lift off the curves. Three, two, one, mission, lift off. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. It's really hard to explain living and working in zero G. It's fascinating how normal it becomes so quickly. It just feels like you've done it your whole life.
We are on the cusp of the third crewed launch for the commercial crew program, signifying a regular cadence of human spaceflight launches from right here at Kennedy Space Center. Joining me now is Center Director Bob Cabana. Thank you so much for being here today with us. Absolutely. My pleasure, Jasmine. This, what an awesome morning. Right, right. We're up before the sun. Yep. Yeah, yeah. we are so glad to have you here. What's your reaction to this return to regular human spaceflight launches? All I can say is it's about time. It was so great last May when Bob and Doug launched for the first time in nine years, humans to space on a U.S. rocket from U.S. soil here at the Kennedy Space Center, then to get crew one up there last November. And now this is really cool because Megan's flying in the same capsule that Bob, her husband, went to space in last May. I mean, this is, it's, it's awesome to have this regular cadence again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We are just, we're thrilled to be here. We're, we're thrilled to see, you know, history being made. And in addition to the excitement from today's launch, we are also coming off our celebration of Earth Day. Can you talk to us about how we launch from Earth for Earth? What is Kennedy Space Center doing to, to benefit our home uh, planet? Kennedy Space Center has an absolutely excellent environmental program. You know, first off, our 144,000 acres here, it's the uh, it's a national wildlife refuge managed for us by the Fish and Wildlife Service. I've been out and seen the sea turtles. I've I've helped count eggs, look at eggs, see the nest. It's it's awesome. It is so cool. You know, we just signed an agreement with uh, Florida Power and Light. Uh, they have put in a 491 acre solar farm. It it can it takes care of like 15,000 homes. The electricity that this solar farm generates. You know, we want to be very uh, ecologically friendly. You know, one of the neat things that we're doing here at Kennedy Space Center, we're responsible for uh, plants, growing plants in space, growing plants when we go to the moon, going to Mars, uh, food for the astronauts. Uh, real processed food loses nutrition over time. And there's a psychological benefit to having uh, plants in space, too. So I think it's kind of cool to be able to take, you know, part of planet Earth with us into right. space as we move on. But no, I, I just I'm really proud of our environmental program here at KSC. Right, absolutely. And you really understand the importance of taking pieces of home uh, up to the space station. Um, you have flown four times on shuttle. You understand probably more than most of us how our astronauts are feeling today. So have you spoken to them recently? How are they doing? Uh, the crew is doing outstanding. I, I talked to them the other night. They are ready to go. Uh, everything's tracking well on the launch. I can't wait to see those guys uh, blast off. I got to see them come out of crew quarters and get in their uh, Teslas and drive out to the pad. They're all looking great. Their families are great. But, you know, I know they're really focused right now. This is uh, when you once you strap into that spaceship, you're just thinking about doing everything right, making sure that you do your job to get safely to space. Right, right. Now, and you have seen, you know, how this uh, spaceport has changed over time. You were recently recognized as the longest serving <laughs> center director. So congratulations on that. Can you talk to us about how it's evolved over time? Absolutely. You know, uh, the shuttle paid for everything at the Kennedy Space Center. And of course, that program came to an end in July of 2011. Uh, we had about 15,000 contractors and civil servants working here at the end of the shuttle program. When Atlantis landed on a Thursday in July, on Friday, 2,000 contractors got pink slips and walked out the door. We went from a workforce of 15,000 down to 7,500. Then we took a look at, hey, what do we need to support the future? You know, and the future was SLS and Orion, but it was also enabling commercial operations. And uh, we got a lot of stuff off our books that uh, we had no need for that didn't support commercial operations or the SLS Orion Artemis program. And then what was left, we said, hey, how can we enable commercial operations with this? We went out for notices of availability on this uh, extra facilities that we had. And look at us today. We've got Boeing and SpaceX. Boeing's building the uh, CST-100 Starliner in a facility right over here. The Air Force X-37 orbital test vehicles operating out of these former shuttle facilities over here. Uh, we got SpaceX out on pad 39A where we went to the moon and launched shuttles. A 20-year use agreement to uh, utilize that pad, launch and cargo and cruise to the International Space Station as well as her commercial missions. Uh, Space Florida is operating the what used to be the shuttle landing facility now and commercializing it. Uh, we've got Exploration Park, a research and development park on NASA property outside the secure perimeter. Space Florida operates that. We got Blue Origin out there. We got more companies coming in. I mean, it's just, this is an exciting time for America's space program. Right, right. No, absolutely. You know, there's a bright future right here at Kennedy Space Center. Director Bob Cavana, thank you so much for being here with us today. Now we're gonna take it back to Jesse and Hawthorne for a launch update. Have it in my script if that helps. 
Thanks, Jasmine. We're just T minus one hour and 14 minutes from launch, and we're getting pretty excited over here. Since arriving at the spacecraft, the crew were helped by our closeout engineers to get into their seats, attach their suits to special umbilicals that provide breathing air and a communication link to Dragon Systems. They conducted suit leak checks, which were successful, and communications checks with the core here in Hawthorne, which is the person who will speak to them directly throughout the mission, as well as the launch director in Florida. This is where they're checking their compass through both ground stations and data tracking and data relay satellites that we'll use to talk to the crew the entire way to the station. And after those suit leak checks, the closeout team was able to seal the hatch, which also gets its own leak check. The closeout team has departed the pad, and weather operators will kick off their final check on wind speeds at the pad, which will be used during the final go, no-go for launch. Now, before we get to that final go, no go, the various teams at both NASA and SpaceX will do an internal go poll, making sure conditions are right with the Falcon 9, the Dragon, the crew, the range, and the space station before that final go is given. Let's check back in on Houston for a status on the team supporting the space station on their readiness for launch. Courtney. Thanks, Gary. The team here in Mission Control Houston remains go for launch. All systems on board the station that are required to be healthy for this mission are continuing to look good. Before the station team is go for launch, they must verify that key systems on board the station are functioning as expected. This includes life support systems like oxygen generation, carbon dioxide removal, and the water recycling system that allows us to reuse about 90% of the water we send to station. We're also ensuring that the computers that allow us to command the station major subsystems, essentially the station's nervous system, are functioning normally. We also work with our Russian counterparts to ensure that both methods of controlling the station's attitude are fully functional. This includes the large U.S. gyroscopes and the thrusters found on the Russian segment. Both systems play a critical role during Dragon's docking. Mission Control Houston will be closely monitoring the crew's flight and checking off milestones for most of the journey. Again, Flight Director Paul Kanya is now on console, leaving flight controllers here in Houston for launch, and Flight Director Scott Stover will lead teams for docking tomorrow, expected to take place at 4.10 a.m. Central Time. The International Space Station team is ready for launch, so I'll send it back to Hawthorne. Gary? All right, thank you, Courtney. As we mentioned, the Crew-2 astronauts will spend about six months on the International Space Station. During this time, the Crew-1 astronauts will depart the station and return to Earth. They're set to undock from the station in the Crew Dragon Resilience on April 28th and splash down off the coast of Florida, where they'll be picked up at sea by one of SpaceX's recovery vessels. Next, SpaceX will launch Commercial Resupply Mission 22, or CRS-22, to the space station to deliver cargo and supplies to Crew 2 and the astronauts and cosmonauts aboard. It will automatically dock to IDA-3 at the zenith port of the Harmony module. Before Crew-2 returns home, they will hand the baton to the next crew to arrive at the orbiting lab on Crew-Dragon, the Crew-3 crew. That mission is targeted to launch this fall. It will carry Crew-Dragon Commander Raja Chari, Pilot Tom Marshburn, whom are both of NASA, Mission Specialist Matthias Marer of the European Space Agency, as well as a fourth crew member who will be added soon. The Crew-3 astronauts will also complete a six-month mission as expedition crew members aboard the space station. They will will be joined there by three additional crewmates who will launch on a Russian Soyuz spacecraft. This will mean that seven people will be on the space station at one time, allowing NASA to effectively double the amount of space, the amount of science conducted in space. This will be Chari's first trip to space, but he has more than 2,500 hours of flight time as a test pilot. The U.S. Air Force Colonel is also a member of NASA's Artemis team and is eligible for assignment to a future mission to the moon. Crew 3 will be Marshburn's third visit to the space station and his second long duration mission. He flew on STS-127 and Expeditions 34 and 35. Marshburn is also a medical doctor who once served as a flight surgeon and medical operations lead for the space station. Like Chari, Maurer will be making his first trip to space with the Crew 3 mission. He has extensive experience in engineering and research, and he spent 16 consecutive days in an underwater laboratory as part of NASA's Extreme Environment Mission Operations. Now let's head back over to Marie at Kennedy Space Center. How's it going over there, Marie? Thanks, Gary. Uh, things looking good here in Florida. If you are just now joining us, 
Welcome to coverage for the mission known as Crew-2, NASA and SpaceX's third flight with crew to the International Space Station. We are at T-minus one hour, nine minutes and counting until liftoff. Uh, myself and uh, Kate Tice and Tracy Caldwell Dyson here have all been vaccinated uh, against COVID-19, and that's why uh, you see us here sitting together without masks on. Uh, liftoff is still holding for 5.49 and two seconds Eastern time, and we're tracking uh, no issues at the moment with Falcon 9 or Dragon. The range is green and uh, weather is looking good. Over the last three hours, our crew of Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Toma Pesquet, and Aki Hoshide donned their SpaceX suits in the historic crew quarter suit up room. Uh, they walked out of the crew quarters building just as every astronaut to fly from this spaceport has done since Apollo 7. And then they were uh, transported to the pad where they climbed inside the SpaceX Crew Dr Dragon Endeavor, uh, which we are watching live on your screen. Well, this is SpaceX's third time flying astronauts in Crew Dragon. It will be the first time a European astronaut will fly aboard Dragon. If you remember back in November, we launched NASA astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, Shannon Walker, and JAXA astronaut Suichi Noguchi uh, to the International Space Station, and those four are nearing the end of their six-month science mission. They are scheduled to return home to Earth just a few days after the Crew 2 astronauts arrive on station. Over the next hour, we will conduct a series of polls to get ready for launch, have the crew arm the launch escape system, and begin fueling Falcon 9. Launch is set for 5.49 a.m. Eastern Time. This will include a 12-minute flight to orbit and then a 23.5-hour flight to dock with the International Space Station tomorrow at approximately 5.10 a.m. Eastern Time. So we're approaching T-minus one hour till launch. Tracy, what is going through the astronauts' head right now as they're, they're seated in their capsule and they're, they're ready to go? They still have another 60 minutes, minutes to go. Can you give us any in insight into what they may be experiencing right now? Well, well, normally I would say, you know, building off of experience that um, inside uh, an hour, you're, um, it, it seems like eternity before those engines light. Uh, you're in there chatting it up with your with crewmates, but watching these guys, they're, they're having a little party in there. Uh, hand signals are flying. I understand they're playing, they're playing a game that, that we thought was rock, paper, scissors. Um, <laughs> I'm learning from friends uh, that um, it's actually a game that Toma knew when he was a kid and um, had shared it with his crewmates. And so uh, I guess there's no better way to bond than through childhood um, memories and that are being recreated in, in, in the capsule right now. Uh, but uh, all kidding aside, um, these guys are um, probably glancing back and forth at their monitors uh, like you see there and um, just checking systems, uh, making sure that they're uh, keeping track that um, of what's going on with the vehicle, uh, listening to the sights and sounds, maybe a little bit of chit chat, but uh, um, inside an hour they're listening up for uh, what might be coming in through their ear from the uh, teams on the ground. Sure. Today's flight is the second of six planned rotational missions NASA has contracted already with SpaceX as part of the agency's commercial crew program. The success of the Demo-2 test flight last year allowed NASA to complete certification for SpaceX to fly astronauts like these regularly to and from the International Space Station, and that paved the way for the Crew-1 launch last fall. Now this next crew is getting ready to lift off in the exact same capsule named Endeavor that Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley first flew in almost one year ago. We've been hearing from the crew on board Dragon. Uh, like you can see there, they're currently strapped into their seats and they've already gone through all of their communication and suit leak, check, leak checks. Uh, they're able to follow all the milestones that they still have ahead of them on the displays there just above them. Uh, which allow them to gain insight into all of the Dragon and Falcon 9 systems as we continue to proceed towards launch. So right now, as we're coming up to the T-minus one hour and five minute mark, let's check in with Hawthorne for a status on both vehicles. John, what updates do you have for us now? Okay, we've had, as you've been saying, a smooth countdown. The SpaceX team is working no issues and the pace is beginning to pick up. In the Falcon 9, final propulsion checkouts of the first and second stages in the engines began just a few minutes ago in preparation for propellant loading. Now, T-minus 45 minutes, 
the team will report their readiness with a final electronic go no go poll. At T minus 35 minutes, Falcon 9 propellant loading will begin. The Dragon spacecraft you can see right here on the monitor with the crew access arm next to it. Earlier today, the Dragon operators performed a series of checkouts of the Dragon flight systems, and the spacecraft is also currently go for launch. The four astronauts are currently inside Dragon and the hatch is closed. The SpaceX closeout team has left the pad and they'll be outside of the blast danger area very shortly. Now, before we can start loading propellant on the Falcon 9, we've got two major items to perform. First, we need to retract that crew access arm away from the Dragon capsule to its launch position. Now that'll happen between T minus 44 and T minus 42 minutes. And we move the access arm away to obviously clear the way for launch, but we also do it in case the Dragon capsule has to leave the launch pad in the event of an emergency before launch. Now, once the arm is out of the way, the launch escape system will be armed. And with these two events complete, Dragon will be ready for Falcon propellant loading. Now, the range is currently clear for launch from historic pad 39A, the worldwide network of ground stations and the tracking and data relay satellites are ready to support Dragon as it heads into orbit. On the weather front, weather continues to look good, both at the surface level, the upper altitudes. We are continuing to wait for a final input from the weather team coming up in about five minutes on ground level winds in case we had a Dragon abort somewhere near the launch pad. Right now, those, condi those conditions are go but we're getting one more set of balloon data to make sure that everything is good. Now today we have an instantaneous launch window at 5.49.02 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, or just after 49 minutes past this hour. Now once we begin loading propellant, there's no opportunity to change the T0. We are committed, we're gonna get one chance at it today. But the good news, Jesse, at T minus 62 minutes and counting, we are go for launch. Thanks, John. It's good to hear that we are still go. Today's launch marks the second time a rotational crew will fly on a commercial spacecraft, and each of our crew members brings a diverse set of experiences to today's flight. Crew Dragon Commander Shane Kimbrough will be making his third trip to space. He was born in Killeen, Texas and raised in Atlanta and was selected as an astronaut in 2004. Kimbrough is a retired U.S. Army Colonel and holds degrees in aerospace engineering and operations research. He first launched aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor on STS-126, then aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft for Expedition 49 and 50. Kimbrough has spent a total of 189 days in space and has performed six spacewalks. Pilot Megan MacArthur will be making her second trip to space, but her first one to the space station. She was born in Honolulu, but considers California her home state. She holds degrees in aerospace engineering and oceanography and was selected as a NASA astronaut in 2000. MacArthur served as a mission specialist aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis on STS-125, the final servicing mission of the Hubble Space Telescope in 2009. She operated the shuttle's robotic arm over the course of 12 days and 21 hours, capturing the telescope and maneuvering crew members throughout the five spacewalks to upgrade Hubble's science instruments, along with removal and replacement of other components to lengthen the telescope's life. Hubble continues to operate to this day, providing scientists the opportunity to make more and more deep space discoveries. Mission Specialist Aki Hoshide has suited up for his third space flight today. Born in Tokyo, Hoshide was selected as an astronaut in 1999 by the National Space Development Agency of Japan, known today as JAXA. Hoshide earned his degrees in aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering. He flew on STS-124 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery to deliver and install Japan's science laboratory, Kibo. He also flew aboard the Russian Soyuz on Expeditions 32 and 33 for a 124-day visit to the Guardian space station. SpaceX. Things continue to progress nominally. Uh, next up is cycling the orbit tank isolation valves to equalize low flow pressure here in about 15 seconds. Copy. We'll be listening. Got some good call-outs there. In 2014, he also served as commander of the 18th NASA Extreme Environment Mission Operation, which was an underwater expedition at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Aquarius Habitat off of Florida's Key Largo Coast.
mission specialist Thomas Pesquet will be making his second trip to space. Born in Rouen, France, Pesquet was selected by ESA as an astronaut in 2009. He has a degree in spacecraft design and control and more than 2,300 flight hours as a commercial airline pilot. Pesquet first flew to space on the Soyuz as a flight engineer for Expeditions 50 and 51. In that time, he worked on more than 50 experiments and performed two spacewalks to maintain the space station. He's logged 197 days in space. Pesquet will be the first European to fly in Crew Dragon, and it will be the first time a European has launched from America in more than a decade. same seat that he did. It's been an awesome countdown so far. Weather is still looking good and the excitement is picking up as we get closer and closer to that T0. That's right, Jesse. We had a great countdown today starting with suit up just over three hours ago. The SpaceX team helped the uh, crew put on their suits and conduct initial checkouts before crew walkout. Crew walkout was SpaceX where Shane Denver, Kimbrough go for launch. SpaceX copies, go for launch. All right, the crew reporting go for launch real time. This just comes right after crew walkout where Shane Kimbrough, Megan MacArthur, Tomah Pesquet, and Aki Hoshide gave final goodbyes with friends and family gathered outside the operations and checkout building before they began that roughly 20-minute ride out to pad 39A. And though it was early morning before dawn, we did still get some awesome views of those Teslas heading down the NASA causeway before the crew arrived at the pad. And once they arrived, they all took a brief moment to enjoy the view of the vehicle that they will be taking flight on. And then they headed up the fixed service structure to begin a process known as crew ingress. That is where the astronauts entered the vehicle and the SpaceX team performed a series of checks to ensure the suits, seats, and vehicle interactions were all functioning properly. About 30 minutes ago, the team closed Dragon's Hatch with crew safely inside. So now uh, in, let's see, less than 57 minutes to go until Dragon starts breathing fire, things will pick up as we get close to the go no go pole to arm the launch escape system and begin propellant loading. The crew pull for readiness was completed at T minus 60, second, 60 minutes, and we did hear those call outs. And the Dragon pull for prop load uh, will occur here in just about a minute at T minus, T, uh, T minus 55 minutes. After that will be T minus 45 minutes will be the internal mission control Hawthorne pull, and then the launch director's pull for propellant loading. And when we get to about T minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract and the crew will get the call to close their visors and arm the launch escape system. Now this is the automated system in place that can fire the eight Super Draco thrusters on Dragon to quickly separate the crew from the rocket, either on the pad or during the flight on the ride uphill. And then once we reach about T minus 35 minutes, propellant loading for the Falcon 9 will begin. Throughout the countdown, we've been getting some pretty incredible views of the astronauts you see there on the right, uh, making their final preparations as well as some close-up views of the suits. The teams have often described the suits as an extension of the Dragon spacecraft, almost a mini spacecraft okay, inside of a spacecraft. So we're hearing that the uh, SpaceX teams are go for launch, and uh, we'll wait for that call for propellant loading. Now, as we wait for that call 
for the teams to begin uh, propellant loading. We are hearing that the uh, there was a weather brief at L minus one hour. We're still looking go uh, for today's launch. Pad escape winds are go. The weather up the ascent corridor is go. Everything tracking as we're inside now, 55 minutes to launch. All right, so again, there are several milestones here now that we're less than an hour away from launch. Most of the calls uh, will be the team's readiness to get ready for propellant loading at T minus 35 minutes. Once we reach that, uh, that mark, propellant loading will begin. Some of the RP-1 refined kerosene will start to fill the uh, tanks of both the stage one and stage two elements of the Falcon 9 rocket. Stage two is smaller and expected to fill up uh, just about 20 minutes prior to launch. But RP-1 uh, refined kerosene will continue to load into the rocket as well as liquid oxygen on both the first and second stages filling up just about three minutes before launch for the first stage and two minutes before launch for the second. All right, and we are hearing that the Dragon teams did conduct that go poll electronically here in Mission Control Houston. The first checked and the first milestone uh, to go for prop load is underway. There's going to be another poll coming up at T minus 45 minutes with the launch teams, and then prop load is set to begin at T minus 35. Until then, let's go over to Jasmine over at the Kennedy Space Center. Jasmine. Thank you, Gary. Joining me now is NASA's Acting Administrator, Steve Jerzyk. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, no, thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. So it's a big day. Um, uh, the commercial crew program is in full force. Last summer, we launched Demo 2 and then Crew 1 in the fall, and we're gearing up to launch four more astronauts from American soil. How does that feel? It, it feels amazing. Um, now, if you would have told me a year ago that we would get um, three crew flights launched in less than a year, I would have just been ecstatic, and I am ecstatic today for the for the third flight with with SpaceX. Um, it's a lot of firsts with this flight, including the first crew rotation. Um, so, um, it, it, having that four crew uh, on station in the U.S. segment um, continuously with the commercial crew program transportation capability is going to accelerate the research and technology development we're doing on station, uh, both to benefit. Uh, folks here on Earth, as well as prepare for our Artemis missions. Right, right. And with this uh, mission today, we're looking at the space station. But of course, with Artemis, we're going even further to the moon. And NASA just announced that they selected SpaceX to develop the first human lunar lander since the Apollo days. What does that mean for our sustained uh, return to the moon? Yeah, so that kind of completes all the systems we need to develop for the first astronaut landing on the moon under Artemis. So we have the SLS. Um, the core stage test uh, was successful a month ago at Stennis, and so that core stage for SLS for Artemis One is on a barge and headed to Kennedy Space Center as you speak. It'll arrive here next week, and that'll mean all the components of SLS are here at Kennedy for integration for the Artemis One mission. Orion is ready to go for Artemis One. Um, the Gateway, we're, uh, we did a review of the Gateway the other day, and the Gateway starting to come together. And then, of course, the last piece is the Ewing landing system, will which will transport astronauts from lunar orbit to the surface and back to back to lunar orbit. So um, it's really exciting to have the landing system uh, in, in full development. It's the last piece that we need for our first Artemis missions. And uh, later this year, hopefully, um, we'll conduct the first Artemis 1 mission, uh, which will be an uncrewed test flight around the moon. 
Right, right. So that is exciting. You know, as we are looking at going to the moon, we're also looking at even further to Mars. We made history just this week with the first flight of Ingenuity. Uh, there's also the MOXIE experiment that is converting uh, the Martian atmosphere into oxygen. So what does that mean for our hopeful uh, one day putting people on Mars? Yeah, so um, the science missions, the robotic missions are really important because they fill knowledge gaps for us that we need to fill to plan out eventually human missions to Mars. So for example, there's a weather station on Perseverance. Um, and for the first time, we're getting five day weather forecasts from Mars, right? So also that weather station characterizes the dust, um, the size and properties of the dust. And that's really important for mitigating that dust in suits and systems. So it fills knowledge gaps, but MOXIE is really important, right? We generated oxygen from atmospheric CO2 and using the resources of Mars um, is critical because it would be very challenging to take all the oxygen and all the fuel and water that we need with us for an astronaut mission to Mars. So getting oxygen from the atmosphere and exploring the frozen water in the regolith or Martian soil is really important because we can break that water down in the oxygen and hydrogen for fuel. We can use it for potable water as well as for breathable air. So this, what we call in-situ resocialization or living off the land, is a real enabler for our human missions to Mars. Right, right. And of course, we've got our sights set on the moon and Mars, but we're taking care of Earth um, at the same time. Uh, NASA recently joined the White House Climate Task Force. Uh, can you tell us how NASA is going to expand its exploration and understanding of our home planet right here? Yeah, so we have um, over about two dozen spacecraft in Earth orbit right now looking down, uh, making observations of the oceans, um, the atmosphere, the land, vegetation, um, what we call the cryosphere, or measuring the height of ice sheets, both in the Arctic and Antarctic. So we use the unique um, view from space to make global measurements over years and decades. And we use that data to conduct research and also to improve models of the Earth systems and modeling. Because if we can't uh, predict climate using our research, we can't mitigate climate. And so that's really important that the research we do informs policy making and informs the most effective policies to mitigate climate change, which is really, really important, not only for the U.S., but for the world. Station, we on ISS, we also have instruments mounted externally on ISS. It's in a unique orbit, that, an inclined orbit that's different from most of our Earth-orbiting spacecraft that look down, which are in a polar orbit. And for certain types of instruments, that orbit is very advantageous. It gives us a lot of coverage and a unique perspective. Um, and so we're using ISS more and more as an Earth observation platform. So, you know, both with, both with the research we do at NASA, with our other government agency partners through the U.S. Global Change Research Program, and also in collaboration with our international partners, um, you know, we're going to continue to make those observations, do that research, and improve our ability to uh, predict uh, climate change. Right, right. We are making progress across the universe. Uh, NASA Acting Administrator Steve Jerzyk, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, now we're going to take it back to John and Hawthorne as action begins to pick up on the pad. Thanks, Jasmine. It's just inside 46 and a half minutes to launch. The SpaceX launch team, they're finishing their final review of data from checkouts of Falcon 9 over the last hour. The launch director is about to poll the team for readiness, both to load propellant and to launch. This will be the last poll before liftoff. The seven SpaceX engineers indicate they are go by electronically voting on an online countdown procedure. We won't hear a verbal poll, something folks may remember from the earlier days of launch and movies like Apollo 13. The launch director is also checking with Dragon Mission Director and the NASA launch manager to make sure everyone is ready to go. Meanwhile, on the Dragon spacecraft, on the screen you can see the crew arm is still in the service position. The crew is on board Dragon, waiting for next instructions, which will be to stow the arm for launch and to arm the launch escape system. Once the launch director gives final instructions to the launch team, which should be coming up in about 30 seconds, the crew arm sequence will be armed and initiated. We should get a good view of the axis arm as it swings away from the capsule, taking about two minutes to move out of the way. Now the range continues to be go for launch. They're monitoring the area around the pad as well as air and sea space around the flight corridor. And on the weather front, the weather officer gave a fantastic at the T-minus one hour briefing. 
the winds for uh, all conditions of flight, liftoff, uh, contingencies, getting into space, everything looks good, both at ground level and upper altitude. So right now, we're just waiting to listen to the SpaceX launch director give the uh, poll and then also give the instructions to the team and move into retracting the crew access arm. So we're gonna listen for a minute to the countdown now. Poll is complete and, for, and team is ready for propellant load and crew access arm retract. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD and they'll approve aborting the launch auto sequence and proceed into launch abort. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the countdown, operator shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort auto sequence. Operators advise launch director whether structural breakup or fires imminent or occurring per Dragon manual escape flight rules. In the event of a fire alarm, key operators will man their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personal safety is threatened, evacuate to the south-facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the crew for movement. Crew access arm retraction started. There you see a live view of the crew access arm retracting away from Crew Dragon in preparation for launch. The countdown clock continues to tick and we're now at T minus 42 minutes and 33 seconds. Uh, we're standing by for the completion of the crew access retraction. Um, this is one of the last major visual milestones that we'll see in preparation for liftoff. Uh, shortly thereafter, we should hear the call out that the launch escape system is armed. And from there, we'll hear that Falcon 9 prop load has started, which is one of my favorite milestones of the launch countdown. We just saw a beautiful shot from inside the white room as the crew arm was uh, moving away. There it is. Um, the capsule, you can just barely see it um, in the corner now, of that opening where um, that is where the side hatch was. Uh, where the astronauts ingress Dragon, and now you can see it continuing to swing away from the Falcon 9 rocket and Crew Dragon Endeavor in preparation for launch. That is a really cool uh, angle. And Tracy, um, as we're watching the crew arm uh, still retracting here, we are about to have the International Space Station yes. fly over us, right? We are, yes, here um, at KSC Kennedy Space Center. Um, looks like in another minute um, to the southeast, traveling across east, northeast, uh, the station uh, should be visible overhead. Crew access arm retraction complete. Now we just heard confirmation that the crew access arm is done retracting. Up next, we'll expect to hear a call to arm the launch escape system. Dragon SpaceX, you are go for section seven, close visors and arm launch escape system. Copy. SpaceX Endeavor, visors are down. Copy, visors down. Okay, so the crew there reporting that they have closed and locked their visors in place in preparation for the launch escape system um, arming. 
the launch escape system is a critical safety feature. Um, this is something that the shuttle did not have. Um, we take very seriously the fact that the astronauts' lives are in our hands, and we take every measure possible to ensure that the crew has options uh, and has an escape in the worst of scenarios. So um, this is simply a, a path to safety for the crew uh, in the event that uh, they need to depart the pad in an emergency um, and also applies to um, aborting the mission even uh, after liftoff and through ascent. And the Crew Dragon Endeavor actually has an enhanced abort capability now. That was one of the improvements made um, to this capsule after Demo 2. And um, it increased uh, the propulsion system on Dragon. Launch escape system by... is verified armed. Okay, so that was confirmation that the launch escape system is armed. Um, and so that is uh, what we have to hear before fueling on the Falcon 9 rocket can begin. So we're, we are about uh, just under four minutes away from that milestone. Uh, but again, we were saying the, the propulsion system, oh, there's a shot of oh, the there space station. There it is. Yeah. Everybody wave. <laughs> <laughs> they, they're waving down at us. I think they're watching right <laughs> they now. Know so. they are. You know they are. Yeah. Hi guys. Hi. Hi. We see you. Uh, so that's super cool. Um, but yeah, the, the abort system, um, it's, it's been improved by about 10%. That's the Super Draco thrusters. There's eight of them built directly into uh, the Crew Dragon. And so that actually um, allowed for a wider uh, margin in terms of uh, wind speeds. Um, so there's greater opportunities uh, for launch. But weather not looking like uh, much of a concern at all today. In fact, uh, last we heard, there's less than 5% chance of violation. So more than 95% go conditions, which is great. Yeah. Pretty rare for <laughs> launches from here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that launch escape system, um, how that works is once the fueling begins at T minus 35 minutes, if there's any kind of emergency, uh, Crew Dragon can launch itself off the top of the Falcon 9 rocket, and then it would splash down under parachutes uh, off the coast in the Atlantic. And we have uh, rescue teams pre-positioned in the event of an emergency uh, if that happens which is highly unlikely, but it's something the NASA and SpaceX and Department of Defense teams uh, practice for extensively. That launch escape system is also equipped to perform an abort after liftoff. We would call that an in-flight uh, launch escape, and that can happen at any point throughout the ascent tra trajectory. Yeah, we actually tested this, this launch escape system in multiple ways. We've, uh, we performed a pad abort test where a Dragon capsule uh, was on the pad and simulated an abort where it took off like uh, a rocket like you've never seen. <laughs> and uh, the Crew-1 mission uh, very recently, and um, we have, yeah, there we, can, there we can see a photo of our Crew-2 astronauts. Uh, actually, they, they're holding up their fingers oh, because yeah. they have soot. They, they signed their initials, their names, uh, into the soot there in the background. So um, I've said before, I really, I love the space, human space flight traditions that we, that we have. And I, I think this is a new one, Tracy, you said it earlier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we never got to draw on the shuttle before we launched, so this is kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, Tama, they were, uh, they were answering questions about it and he started to say we carved our initials and he quickly <laughs> stopped himself. No, 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 we didn't, we didn't carve anything into the Falcon 9. We drew, we, you know, traced our, 
um, initials in the side of the rocket. And so you could see closely in that photo, if you look, you could see the initials of each astronaut. So that's really cool and something that we look forward to yeah. seeing on future uh, reused boosters. This one is uh, set to Download land. Download has started. Okay, we just heard confirmation that uh, fueling has begun on the Falcon 9 rocket. And this first stage booster is set to land on a SpaceX drone ship at sea uh, after liftoff. We are now at T minus 34 minutes, 30 seconds and counting from Crew Dragon's third launch with astronauts and the first for 2021. Today begins the next six month rotation mission to the International Space Station. The launch escape system is armed, which happened just before uh, fueling began at T minus 35 minutes. The Dragon capsule was loaded with propellants uh, about a week and a half ago, just a few miles down the road at what we call Dragon Land. And in order to fly, Dragon needs a fuel and an oxidizer. And Kate, I'll let you talk more about the fuel. Yeah, so for that fuel, we use monomethyl hydrazine or MMH and nitrogen tetroxide or NTO for the oxidizer. Together, these two propellants feed the Draco engines that maneuver Dragon on orbit, as well as the eight Super Draco engines that would power the launch escape system in an abort scenario. And again, now that uh, the fueling is underway on Falcon 9, that means the eight Super Draco engines built directly into Crew Dragon are ready, if needed, to launch the capsule off of the Falcon 9 rocket in an instant, should there be any kind of emergency associated with the rocket or the launch pad. The NASA and SpaceX teams have trained extensively for exactly that type of contingency, uh, along with the Department of Defense, Detachment 3, who does a fantastic job in those training scenarios. Now over to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne for an operations update. John? Well, we are counting down those final minutes, and everything's still looking good for Falcon 9 and Dragon for an on-time launch just under 33 minutes from now. Falcon 9 did begin propel loading just a couple of minutes ago. We heard it. Now the first and second stages of Falcon 9 are each loaded with two liquid propellants. One is fuel. That's loaded into the tank at the bottom of each stage. The other is an oxidizer and that goes obviously into the tank at the top of each stage. Now the fuel that we use to power the Merlin engines is a refined kerosene called RP-1. And the oxidizer loaded on each stage is densified liquid oxygen called LOX. Densified means that it is kept much colder than typical for launch vehicles, and it takes up less volumes. So this allows us to get more oxidizer loaded onto the first and second stages. Now to ignite the fuel and oxidizer in the Merlin rocket engine, we use an ignition fluid called T-TUB. When T-TUB comes in contact with oxygen, it burns. And it gives off a green colored flame. Now, once we've got the flame going, we add the kerosene fuel into the Merlin chamber and the engine ramps up to full power. You might see the green flash just as the second stage engine ignites following stage separation. Now, currently we've just begun. The first stage fuel tank is about right now a little under 10% full. The first stage is the bottom two thirds of the vehicle you see on your screen, the white cylinder topped off by the black cylinder, that makes up the first stage. And then the top one third underneath the Dragon capsule, that's our second stage. Now at this time, the second stage fuel tank is about 8% full. Now the fuel tank, if you were to zoom in, that's where the NASA uh, meatball logo is positioned. And right above it, you can just make out the red NASA worm logo and that's where the liquid oxygen tank is on the second stage. And there's a closer view. Now, in addition to loading the fuel, we're also loading oxygen, the liquid oxygen, onto the first stage. We won't start liquid oxygen loading on the second stage until T minus 16 minutes and 30 seconds. And liquid oxygen will continue loading on both stages until the last few minutes of the countdown. Helium loading into pressure vessels is also underway. We use that to pressurize the tanks in flight as the propellant is pulled out by the Merlin turbo pumps. On board the Dragon spacecraft, you can see here in a close up, the astronauts are monitoring systems while the propellant is loaded into the Falcon 9. 
The crew training in the simulator included playback of sounds that we've recorded in the Dragon capsule during recent flights. So they get an idea what all that hissing and popping uh, and banging is from the vent valves and the pressurization systems. Now the range continues to report no problems. They are go to support launch. And the weather also looks good. I mentioned the T minus one hour briefing. We called it fantastic. Currently, we don't have anything that we are tracking that could be a concern. We have a very small possibility of a pop-up rain shower, but nothing showing up. So right now, 29 minutes, 40 seconds ago, it looks like we've got good weather. Now, as a reminder, today we have an instantaneous launch window. So at this point, if we hear a hold for any reason, we'll have to stand down and target our backup launch opportunity coming in three days. So right now, let's turn it back over to Jesse and Gary for an overview of events that are going to happen after the liftoff of Falcon 9. Great news, John. For Crew 2, the astronauts' flight to station will take about 23 hours, and their journey will be fairly similar to the trip Crew 1 made in November of last year. All right, as we wait T0 in just about 29 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of systems checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. You're looking at a live view of our teams at the Cape as they prepare for liftoff. As we wait for the launch clock to hit zero, we wanted to give you an overview of what the ascent portion of the mission will look like. Once we hit T0 and a successful launch occurs, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into the flight, Falcon 9 engines will throttle up to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as Max-Q. It's worth noting that once we hit Max-Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our nine Merlin engines again. And from there, at about two and a half minutes into flight, we have a series of three events that will happen, it happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin 1D engines shut off in preparation for stage separation, which is our second event. This is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event, SES-1, or second stage engine start number one, is where the MVAC engine lights up and propels the second stage along with our Crew-2 astronauts to orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back to Earth. The first is the entry burn, where three of the nine M1D engines will reignite and then shut down. And this helps to slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the upper parts of the Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was ignited right after stage separation. Once this happens, we'll wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn is just a single engine burn, powerful enough to bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship about nine and a half minutes into the mission. While Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. It's worth noting that these are not the Super Draco engines that would be used during an abort scenario. About 40 seconds after separation, Dragon's nose cone deploy sequence will begin. It will take roughly four minutes for the nose cone hooks to unlatch and open, exposing its guidance navigation controls, or what we call GNC, that will help Dragon autonomously fly to the space station. And lastly, once the nose cone is deployed, the remaining Draco thrusters on the forward bulkhead will be checked. From there, over the next 23 plus hours, Dragon will be in its rendezvous and approach phases, undergoing a number of phasing burns as it makes its way to station. All of that will be coming up soon. For now, let's check back in with Courtney in Mission Control Houston. Courtney. Thanks, Gary. The space station team here in Houston is focused, and the critical systems on the station continue to function Start normally. The teams have verified the command path. From the ground through our constellation of communication satellites to the station. Everything is nominal and the station will be ready to receive Dragon tomorrow. 
Once the crew arrives at the station, they'll join Expedition 65. While on board, their official designation will be flight engineers, except for JAXA's Aki Hoshide, who will take command of the space station from NASA's Shannon Walker just before Crew 1 comes home. He'll be the station commander until the fall, when he'll hand the reins to European, European Space Agency Thomas Pasquet for the final part of their mission. Flight Director Paul Kanya is on console now, leading flight controllers in Houston for launch, and Flight Director Scott Stover will lead teams for docking tomorrow. Just a reminder that a launch today will take about 23 and a half hours to get to station with a docking to the Node 2 forward port scheduled tomorrow at 4.10 a.m. Central. Once Dragon is docked to the station, the team here in Houston will assist Dragon and space station astronauts with leak checks as they will work to open hatches on both Dragon and the inside of the station's pressurized mating adapter. We expect hatch open to take place approximately two hours after dock docking. That's it for us here in Mission Control Houston. I'll send it back over to the team in Florida. Marie? All right, thanks, Courtney. Uh, you're looking live at the Falcon 9 rocket and SpaceX Crew Dragon. Um, and we can see liquid oxygen venting uh, off the rocket. That is uh, normal and expected. It is now T minus 23 minutes, 50 seconds and counting from the third astronaut launch from US soil in the past year and the first with two international partners aboard. Commander Shane Kimbrough, Pilot Megan MacArthur and Mission Specialist Toma Pesquet and Aki Hoshide are strapped into their seats inside the Crew Dragon Endeavor on top. There's an inside view. We can see them live as the Falcon 9 rocket fueling operation is well underway now. The launch escape system is armed and that means the Crew Dragon is prepared to launch itself away from the Falcon 9 rocket in case of an emergency on the pad or after liftoff. So far, operations look and sound as expected, and we are counting down to liftoff at 549 Eastern Time. This mission is the continuation of rotational crew flights to the International Space Station from U.S. soil on private rockets and spacecraft. This wouldn't have been possible without the success of the NASA SpaceX Demo-2 test flight last year and the safe delivery of the Crew-1 astronauts to the space station last fall for a long-duration mission. Those Crew-1 astronauts are preparing to return to Earth shortly after Crew-2 arrives at station. And this will be the first time we'll see two Crew Dragons docked to the space station at the same time. Crew-1's resilience and Crew-2's endeavor that's on the launch, launch pad right now. With the arrival of the Crew-2 team, uh, I believe that'll bring the headcount on station to 11 people. And as much as I love cam camping, that down sound, <laughs> that does sound like it would be a little crowded up there. <laughs> yeah, you know, you count 11 people on board the station, nine of them in the U.S. segment. We've got four crew quarters, which are basically crew bedrooms. Uh, we've got both commanders of the Dragons sleeping in their vehicles. That leaves three people needing a place to sleep. That's Suichi, Shannon, and Victor. They'll be in the gym, the Columbus, and the airlock, respectively. So you could, you could say it's a quite a full house. They'll be camping out, <laughs> rolling out their sleeping bags on rack fronts. So it'll be, uh, it'll be tight. What a, what a great benefit to being commander. You have your own <laughs> private suite <laughs> <laughs> with windows. Yeah. It's a nice place to be. Yeah. And that's honestly the, the window shots that we have been receiving from the crew have been one of my favorite things from the crew one team up there. And even Bob and Doug, whenever they were up there as well, um, just the, the view outside of the, the crew dragon window, it's, it's actually my phone background right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just incredible, and I love what, what we, that we get to that they share their perspective with us from from uh, uh, above. Let's give you a quick recap of who the astronauts are uh, sitting inside the capsule here in the foreground, uh, sitting closest to uh, the front of your screen is Commander Shane Kimbrough. Uh, he is commanding the Crew Dragon Endeavor today, and he is a native of Texas, making his third trip to space. Uh, the retired U.S. Army Colonel first launched aboard the Space Shuttle Endeavor on STS-126, then aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft for Expeditions 49 and 50. Kimbrough has spent a total of 189 days in space and performed six spacewalks. Pilot Megan MacArthur will be making her second trip to space, but her first to the space station. She was born in Honolulu. Engine but, 
She was born in Honolulu, but considers California her home state. MacArthur served as a mission specialist aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis on STS-125, the final servicing mission of the Hubble Space Telescope. She operated the shuttle's robotic arm over the course of 12 days and 21 hours, capturing the telescope and maneuvering the crew members throughout five spacewalks to lengthen the telescope's life. And mission specialist Aki Hoshide is embarking on his third space flight today. The JAXA astronaut from Tokyo previously flew on STS-124 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery to deliver and install Japan's science laboratory, Kibo. He also flew aboard the Russian Soyuz on Expeditions 32 and 33 for a 124-day visit to the space station. And in the uh, far corner of your screen is Mission Specialist Thomas Pesquet. He will be making his second trip to space. Born in Rouen, France, Pesquet first flew to space on the Russian Soyuz as a flight engineer for Expeditions 50 and 51. In that time, he worked on more than 50 different experiments and performed two spacewalks with Kimbrough to maintain the space station. He has logged 197 days in space. Pesquet will be the first European to fly in Crew Dragon, and it will be the first time a European astronaut has launched from America in more than a decade. Each of these four crew members will join Expedition 65 once they arrive at the International Space Station, with Aki Hoshide taking over as commander of the station right before Crew-1 departs. And as we're looking at uh, a live view of the pad, again, fueling is underway. We heard a call out uh, during those bio recaps that um, the RP-1 load is complete on the second stage. And we have a really uh, special treat if we could take a view of Bob Benkin's spacesuit. Uh, we have that uh, in studio. That is the, uh, the actual spacesuit worn by Bob Benkin uh, during the Demo 2 test flight. And you can see the photo of his wife, Megan MacArthur, uh, in the photo there. And she is sitting in the same spacecraft in the same seat that Bob did um, almost a year ago on the Demo-2 mission. Uh, Megan is the pilot for this mission. There's a shot of uh, Bob's spacesuit on the left and Doug Hurley's spacesuit on the right. This was a couple days ago during the pre-launch news conference. So again, looking uh, live at the pad, uh, Falcon 9 will have uh, 1.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff and uh, we've We've heard it sounds like a gorilla sitting on your chest. Would you say that's accurate, Tracy? Yeah, yeah. I've never had actually a gorilla on my chest, but I imagine that um, uh, one would be that heavy. That uh, the, the feeling that you have in your chest is pretty significant. Once again, the white cloud that we see there is expected, totally normal. That's just the liquid oxygen uh, vaporizing, essentially, as it comes into contact with this humid Florida air. Uh, as a point of reference, this the liquid oxygen that we load on board Falcon 9 is uh, super chilled to help densify um, the that liquid oxygen. When I say super chilled, I mean really, really cold. Uh, we're talking like <laughs> negative 336 degrees. So um, of course, whenever it comes into ambient air, um, it will turn into its gaseous state. Which we load has started. Okay, and there we just heard the call out that second stage locks load has just begun. And so the mission teams um, that we've seen in control rooms from Kennedy Space Center to Houston to Hawthorne are all uh, laser focused on keeping this crew safe uh, from this point and all the way to the space station and back home in six months. We had a chance to ask about their mindset right now from a couple of their leaders. There's a very delicate dance between the weather, <laughs> normally the weather and the operations and, you know, making sure all these complex systems are working correctly together. And what is really important is just how calmly, quietly, efficiently the team's working through every single one of those things. It's why we train. People are very passionate about this program, as am I, and uh, they know the consequences of what they're doing. They know that the crew's lives depend on what they're doing. This human spaceflight endeavor requires diligence every day on the job, and I think our team knows that. I definitely feel like those crew members are in our hands, and we need to 
be there, thinking straight, making sure we're making the right decisions so that we're getting that crew safely to the International Space Station. And that was um, Kathy Leaders and Steve Stitch, um, who have been in charge of the NASA team uh, for much of the life of the commercial crew program and have worked very closely um, with the folks on the SpaceX side who have gotten to know these astronauts uh, on a personal level and um, have taken such care in all of the checkouts and the, uh, the paranoia reviews, as they're called, to make sure that they're constantly looking for problems to uncover um, to make sure that um, every every leaf, every stone is unturned to make this safest uh, this flight as safe as possible for the crew. Again, it is now T minus 14 minutes, 15 seconds, and counting. Uh, liftoff will be about one hour before sunrise here on Florida Space Coast, and if we're lucky, we may see a beautiful contrail at first light. At the time of launch at 5.49 and two seconds Eastern time, the space station will be flying 258 miles over the Indian Ocean, south of Sri Lanka. And now with T minus 13 minutes, 50 seconds and counting, we wanna focus on the pad as we proceed through the final stretch of the countdown. We will turn it over to Hawthorne to take us through launch at 5.49 this morning. John? We're inside T minus 14 minutes. Everything is still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon, 49 minutes and two seconds after the hour. Falcon 9 began propellant load at T minus 35 minutes. Loading of the RP-1 fuel onto stage two is complete. Fuel loading is continuing on the first stage. We're over half full and it'll finish at T minus six minutes. The densified liquid oxygen loading is continuing on the first stage and we began loading liquid oxygen onto the second stage a few minutes ago. The liquid oxygen loading will wrap up T minus three minutes on the first stage, about T minus two minutes on the second stage. Checkouts of the thrust vector controllers, what we call TVC wiggles are coming up along with throttle valve checkouts on the engines. That's where we move the engines a little bit, make sure the hydraulics are ready to go. Currently the range is go, ready to support, working no issues. And we continue to have good weather, both at the launch pad, at ground level, at the upper altitude winds, and downrange at the contingency landing sites. On the Dragon spacecraft, the Dragon mission director and team, they're reporting no issues. Their communication checkouts are complete. The crew access arm is retracted, as you see on your monitors, away from the vehicle. The launch escape system is armed. The crew is strapped in and ready to go. Final instructions of the crew will be coming at T minus 10 minutes. They'll just configure their displays for launch. That'll give them insight to how the launch is pr proceeding and it provides constant updates on vehicle health. And for Dragon at T minus five minutes, we'll hear it enter terminal count as they transition to internal power. Now we're gonna hear continued call outs on the countdown net as we get close to T minus zero and to the liftoff. Now, Gary, we talked about the ascent sequence of events that are coming up here. You and Jesse went through that a little while ago, but we're also gonna have abort modes. Can you explain a little bit about what the abort mode callouts are that we might hear? That's right, John. Uh, we're continuing to track that the Falcon 9 and Dragon are looking good for launch, but just in case anything were to happen, Dragon is fully prepared uh, to initiate an abort and use those Super Draco engines to escape from a speeding Falcon 9. On the way uphill, you'll hear a series of letter and number combinations. Uh, those will denote the stage that the rocket is on and the abort zone uh, that we're on as well. On first stage, you'll hear abort zones A and B. Uh, that will cover the Falcon 9's ascent up to about the northern border of uh, North Carolina, about seven and a half to eight miles uh, in altitude. And the stage two will have stage two A through E. Mostly it will be stage A or stage 2A uh, abort zone, but towards the end of the six minutes that stage two will be firing, you'll hear the numbers start going out from B to E, uh, with E being an abort to orbit. Uh, all of these capabilities enabled on the Dragon spacecraft to make sure that the crew uh, will be delivered safely into orbit. 
inside 10 minutes and 30 seconds, we should be hearing. Uh, so final status, maybe a good luck and uh, Godspeed from some of the ground teams here, uh, ensuring that the crew is ready to go, that Falcon 9, Dragon, and all the support teams are ready for launch. Dragon, SpaceX, confirmed crew displays are configured for launch. Displays are configured for launch. SpaceX copies. Shane, Megan, Aki, Tama, we're thrilled to have the crew on board Endeavor once again and truly honored to have you, you all at the helm. It's been a pleasure training alongside you ahead of this historic launch. We wish you a great mission, good luck, and enjoy the ride. Thank you, Chad, Christian, Frank, and all the teams who got our crew and vehicle ready for this mission. I want to say a special thank you to our families and friends. We're incredibly grateful for your support and sacrifice during our training and our upcoming flight. Our crew is flying astronauts from NASA, ESA, and JAXA, which hasn't happened in over 20 years. We're excited to represent our nations, agencies, and all of humanity. Off the Earth, for the Earth, Endeavor is ready to go. All right, some celebratory handshakes from inside the Crew Dragon. That was the voice of the Corps, uh, Chad Healy, here in uh, Mission Control Hawthorne. Uh, next series of events, John, will be the engine chill. Everything's looking good so far. Yeah, it is. Uh, we're actually watching uh, the uh, fuel trim valves on the Merlin 1D engines going through some checkouts right now. And as you said, at T-minus seven minutes, we're going to start uh, a sequence of events that begins with opening the pre-valves. Currently, the liquid oxygen, the kerosene fuel on the Falcon 9 first, second stages is separated from the Merlin engines. T-minus seven minutes, just over a minute from now, we open the pre-valves. That allows propellant down to the top of the engine or the uh, inlet to the turbo pumps. At the same time, we open up bleed valves on the turbo pumps and that allows a little bit of that densified ultra cold liquid oxygen to flow through the pump and to chill down the liquid oxygen pump. That way, when we get to T minus two seconds and we spin the pumps up and everything comes to full power, we're not pulling very cold liquid oxygen through a warm pump. So as that cools it down right now, that'll get it ready for that ignition sequence in the last couple of seconds. So we should hear that call out that the stage one engine chill has started. You'll also hear in flight, uh, about a minute and a half, two minutes into flight, MVAC chill has begun. Uh, that's also a repeat sequence there where we open uh, the bleed valve and begin chilling that engine one more time before it lights after stage separation. Right now we're waiting to see the pre-valves come open and the chill begin. Stage one engine chill has started. Yep, and there's the call out. We've got indication pre-valves coming open on the engines and we have begun to chill in the Merlin engines for flight. That's right, John. Now inside six minutes, 40 seconds, RP-1 rocket grade kerosene is completely filled in the second stage. We're anticipating about 30 more seconds for the first stage to be completely filled with that RP-1 refined kerosene. The liquid oxygen will continue to flow through the first and second stages up to the final minutes before T-0. All right, confirmation, we have 100% fill of RP-1 on both the first and second stages, six minutes to go until an instantaneous launch window today. The next milestone will be uh, Dragon to transition to configure for terminal count. And this time, uh, terminal count, the Dragon will be on internal power, no longer relying on the lines from the ground. And from there, the Falcon 9 propellant tanks will pressurize for strong back retract. That'll be another visual milestone. The clamps just uh, 
below the dragon's unpressurized trunk will open and the strong back will tilt back just two degrees and right after liftoff back to 45 degrees. Again, RP-1 kerosene, both on the first and second stages. Liquid oxygen continues to flow through on the first and second stages. That very densified, very cold liquid oxygen. Dragon has transitioned to configure for terminal count. Falcon 9 propellant tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. All right, John, good calls and right on time. Dragon is now on internal power. Okay, next major event coming up is going to be opening the clamp arms around the second stage in preparation for retracting the strong back away from the vehicle to get ready for liftoff. Strong back is retracting. We heard the call out. Strong back is beginning to retract. We're into the automated sequence. We should see the clamp arms that are just visible there uh, around the top of the second stage begin to open up. Once they are open, then the strong back will begin to move away from the Falcon 9. Watching the sequence, a nice view from up on top of the fixed service structure. The arms are opening. And we're beginning to recline away from the Falcon 9. We'll move the strong back two degrees away from the Falcon 9. That'll get it ready for liftoff. And at T0, when we the flight computer commands liftoff, the hydraulics on the strong back will pull it to a position 45 degrees away from the Falcon 9 giving it the clearance for launch. So right now, the strong back is moving away. Everything proceeding nominally. It's great to, to yeah. hear, uh, John. We're also anxiously awaiting the liquid oxygen complete on the first stage. Should hear that call very shortly. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. Stage one locks load is complete. Hey, okay, we've heard the call out. Stage one locks load is complete. We're loading liquid oxygen on the second stage for about another 30 seconds or so. Once we get the liquid oxygen load complete on the second stage, the propellant line that runs up the side of the strong back that carries liquid oxygen will vent that line down to make sure there's no liquid in it when we get to liftoff. When we do that, we open up valves on the strong back. And as uh, Kate and Marie were talking earlier, when we vent off that very cold gaseous oxygen, it'll merge with the warm, humid Florida air, and you'll get a large white plume of condensation off of the back of the strong back. That'll be normal coming about a minute and a half before launch. Everything continuing to look good. Stage two locks load is complete. Dragon is in auto idle. All right, with that, the Falcon 9 is fully fueled. We have fuel on both the first and second stages, and both stages are filled with liquid oxygen. Gas closeout has started. Expect loud venting. Dragon is also in auto idle. The flight computer is on Dragon. Maintaining their calculations, standing by, waiting for the T0 mark. One minute, 15 seconds until launch. The one minute mark Dragon will transition to countdown and the flight termination system will arm. The computers on Falcon 9 will be talking to the computers on Dragon and can issue an abort if necessary. FTS is armed. Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling. Dragon is in countdown. All right, 50 seconds to go. Everything is ready for an on-time launch today. Dragon, SpaceX, go for launch. Copy, go for launch. Ground teams are ready and the crew inside Dragon is ready. 
30 seconds to go yeah, until launch. Seconds. T-minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Mission and liftoff. Guys, one one Endeavor and Crew 2. Copy, 1 Alpha. Endeavor launches once again. Four astronauts from three countries on Crew 2 now making their way to the one and only International Space Station. The vehicle is pitching down range. Nine Merlin engines on the first stage providing 1.7 million pounds of thrust. Hearing good calls in first stage performance so far. We are T plus 30 seconds into the second rotational crew mission on board Dragon and Falcon 9. Falcon 9 will be throttling down the nine Merlin engines shortly here in preparation for in preparation for maximum dynamic pressure. And there's that call out for the throttle down. Maximum dynamic pressure max Q is the largest structural load that the vehicle sees throughout ascent. So throttling down does help us pass. Throttling down helps us pass through this period, which should be coming here shortly. Q. There's that call out that we have just passed through Max Q. Stage one throttle up. And one Bravo. Now... Copy one Bravo. All right, one Bravo is the second abort mode on the first stage. The first stage continues to fire for two minutes thirty-five seconds. One and a half minutes into today's flight. Falcon 9 now traveling at 1,500 miles an hour. And the engine chill has started. All right, the engine chill for the second stage single Merlin engine has started. About 30 more seconds of the first stage firing to bring our four astronauts into orbit. Now from here coming up in about 20 some seconds, we're going to have three major milestones. We'll have shutdown of the nine Merlin engines. We're beginning to throttle them down. We will then get stage, stage separation throttle down. and then we will get ignition of the second stage engine to propel Dragon and the Falcon 9 second stage into orbit. Hey, Copy two alpha. Confirmed. Acquisition signal right. In the ignition. We have ignition of the second stage. You see the green flash of that T TEB fluid. The ex extent expansion nozzle on the second stage Merlin vacuum glowing that bright red that we like to see. Good performance on the second stage so far. And on the left side of your screen, we saw the uh, exhaust of the second stage engine streaming past the first stage as the grid fins are coming out. We also briefly had a view of the lights of Central Florida in the background. Currently, the first stage is continuing to coast up to Apogee. It's unpowered. It'll reach a peak height and then begin to descend back down toward the Earth's atmosphere where it will light three engines to slow down in preparation for what will be a landing burn on the drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. You can see the grid fins are deployed. Right now, the first stage Dragon pulsing. SpaceX, trajectory nominal. We're pulsing the thrusters. Signal Bermuda. Copy, nominal trajectory. We hear a call out from the crew, nominal trajectory. So we're beginning to move the first stage into position so it can do the entry burn. Four minutes, 15 seconds into today's flight. 
second stage propelling our four astronauts up the eastern seaboard will continue to fire. It's a six minute burn to deliver the astronauts into orbit. We'll wait for a cue for a good orbital insertion after that. Meanwhile, we will be hearing uh, check ins on the vehicle's trajectory and performance, as well as check ins with some of the ground stations as it passes over uh, throughout uh, the six minutes of the second stage firing. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Copy nominal trajectory. Getting good views of both the first and second stage from the onboard cameras. Acquisition of signal bus. The New Hampshire tracking station has acquired the second stage telemetry signal. Meanwhile, the first stage has reached apogee and it's now beginning to descend from uh, a height. It's currently about 167 kilometers up. And in a few minutes, we will get the entry burn of the second stage, of the first stage. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Copy nominal trajectory. Right on cue, those check ins on the second stage performance. Once a minute, everything's looking good on Stage2 that second stage. Propulsion is nominal. Stage two continues to climb. The vehicle now exceeding 8,000 miles an hour at an altitude of about 124 miles. And just about one minute from now, we will begin the entry burn of the first stage. That'll consist of lighting the center engine and then shortly afterwards, two more engines for a three engine burn to slow down the first stage in preparation for entering the Earth's atmosphere. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Copy nominal trajectory. Another check in, the crew confirming they're hearing the same thing. The vehicle exceeding are about to exceed about 10,000 miles per hour. Meanwhile, first stage down at 90 kilometers, getting ready to relight three engines for the entry burn. Stage two FTS is saved. We've got the center engine ignition and there come the two side engines. Now this entry burn will last about 29 seconds it's going to significantly slow down the vehicle in preparation for hitting the denser part of the Earth's atmosphere. Entry burn complete. We're down below 35 kilometers, continuing to look good on the first stage, heading to the Atlantic Ocean for a landing on the drone ship. Well, second stage is less than a minute away from cutoff. Stage two in terminal guidance. Shannon. Copy, Shannon. Shannon called out at the back end of the stage two, a few seconds until cutoff. In the shutdown. Dragon SpaceX launch escape system disarmed. Launch escape system disarmed. Copy. Dragon SpaceX nominal orbit insertion. 
Copy, nominal orbital insertion. Right, the Falcon 9 second stage has done its job delivering our four crew into orbit. You hear the applause here at Hawthorne. We're waiting to get a video signal back from the drone ship. Of course, I still love you. And the view from the onboard camera, we saw it just briefly. It looks like first stage on the drone ship. Getting views of the Dragon Trout. So the first stage is on the drone ship, successfully landed. And more importantly, second stage is in a nominal orbit with the Dragon spacecraft getting ready for some important events coming up, Gary. That's right, about two more minutes, the Dragon and the second stage of the Falcon 9 will be in a coast phase. It'll take that long until the spacecraft separates from the Falcon 9. Of course, both uh, now in a nominal orbit. It's great to see some of the views of the Earth as it passes by over the North Atlantic Ocean. All right, we're getting shots of the crew in orbit. I'm looking uh, for that zero G indicator. Can't seem to see it in this shot, but we have a minute to go until we have uh, spacecraft separation. Dragon traveling at nearly 17,000 miles per hour at an altitude of 124 miles. Again, the four-person crew of Endeavor is in orbit right now. Less than 30 seconds until we have spacecraft separation. Ten seconds to spacecraft separation. We should hear words from the core here in uh, Mission Control Hawthorne once we have successful separation. Dragon, they said, Dragon, this is a great rest of your trip. Say hi to the crew of Dragon and Williams and let them know your rocket is home safe. Thanks for flying our crew. Flight proven, crewed Falcon 9. Sierra side, crew 2. Thank you very much. We're great. It's glad to be back in space for all of us, and we'll uh, send our regards to crew 1 when we get there. Thanks. Absolutely stunning views from both inside the cabin, seeing the excitement of our four-person crew inside Endeavor, and watching Endeavor drift away from the camera on the second stage as the Earth passes by on an orbital sunrise. SpaceX Endeavor, are we... And Endeavor, you uh, cut out a little bit there. If the question was, uh, if you're go to open visors, you are go to open visors at this time. Copy and work, thanks. All right, 13 and a half minutes past liftoff. The crew is in orbit, traveling at nearly 17,000 miles an hour. Well, Gary, I don't know about you, but uh, that was a great countdown. <laughs> Everything sounded great. Right on and time, Dragon's actually a little ahead of time. A multi humidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Got a good orbit out of Falcon 9 and first Got stage landed on the drone ship. And we're in the sunlight over the Atlantic Ocean with the Dragon spacecraft. All in all, a great day. 
I think everybody's jealous of the crew in orbit right now, John. Uh, these views, even just from the cameras, are absolutely stunning. It was great to see our crew members uh, get into orbit. They already performed successful checkouts of the 12 service section Dracos around Dragon. The next uh, milestone will be the deployment of the nose cone. That'll be about a five minute process, but that'll expose the forward bulkhead Dracos and prepare them uh, for checkout. There's a phase burn. There's five major burns that are needed to get the Crew Dragon up to rendezvous with the International Space Station over the next 23 hours. And so that first phase burn is coming up real soon in about uh, 35 minutes, actually less than 35 minutes. Jesse, I don't know if you could see the zero G indicator, but I was told it's a penguin. I'm trying to look for it. I'm looking for it too. Keep an eye out on that left hand screen. Meanwhile, the uh, dragon is configured for, for a nose cone deployment. I'll stand by for uh, when that sequence starts. The nose cone itself opens uh, just beyond 90 degrees, about 105 degrees to expose the forward uh, bulkhead Dracos. Those forward bulkhead Dracos, four of them at the very top of the Dragon will do the bulk of the work when it comes to firing the Draco engines for minutes at a time to increase the uh, Dragon speed, altitude, and phasing to catch up with the International Space Station again over the next 23 hours. Meanwhile, we're still getting camera views from the second stage, looking at that expansion nozzle. Did its work beautifully to deliver the four crew into orbit? Dragging over the North Atlantic Ocean. And Gary, this is John. I think I heard a call out on one of the dragon nets that the uh, first set of nose count hooks is open. So it sounds like that sequence is going well. Very good. Well, from here in Hawthorne, it was very exciting to see the uh, Falcon 9 lift off and deliver our four-person crew into orbit. We're going to be with you throughout the entire phase, uh, the rendezvous phase, uh, until Dragon and this four-person crew docks with the International Space Station. That'll be over the next 23 hours. We'll bring you through some of those major burns uh, that are happening. But I am so jealous of Marie and the group <laughs> over there over at the Kennedy Space Center. You actually got to see the launch and probably feel it as well. Marie, what was that like? Oh, it was just spectacular. And, you know, the, the sun hasn't come up yet here in Florida, but, uh, you know, we were able to just turn around and see the launch right behind us and it lit up the sky, just absolutely breathtaking. It was so, um, it was so astounding to see the, the colors. I mean, it was uh, not just your, your usual fireball, but uh, there was um, pulsating towards the end. And uh, Kate, you're much more eloquent uh, describing that sequence, which I appreciate you doing that while we were- Happy to help. <laughs> staring. It was, um, it was so fun. And knowing that um, those guys were enjoying the ride uh, along with uh, the sights that we got to see. Yeah. Uh, made all the difference there's nothing more relieving than um crew in orbit <laughs> yeah. and of course uh it we were so lucky to have clear weather here being able to see uh the re-entry burn as well i was hoping we were going to be able to catch landing burn but uh unfortunately clouds on the horizon did block that view but it was also uh such a treat to be able to see the the re-entry of that uh that first stage as well <laughs> Let's go over to uh, Jasmine to get some reaction. Uh, I think she's with the NASA administrator now. Jasmine. Thanks. Thank you, Marie. Yes, I am joined again here with Steve Jerzyk. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thank you. So we just had the privilege of watching that spectacular launch in person. What was that like? Uh, watching a launch, a particularly a human space launch, will never get old for me. It's just thrilling to see those nine engines light up and it lift off the pad, get to the main gen engine cutoff and separation and get that second stage started. And um, of course, pre-dawn launches are always amazing. And, uh, you know, we could see um, the vehicle pretty much through the entire 
trajectory up to Earth orbit. It was just spectacular. Right. No, absolutely. It was just stunning. And the sun is just now uh, starting to peek over the clouds here. Uh, so do you have any final words of encouragement for our NASA team, our SpaceX team, and our international partners? Yeah, you know, um, partnerships are key to what we do, um, particularly in human spaceflight. Our partnership with SpaceX has been tremendous. Third launch in less than a year um, after almost a 10-year a gap in human space flight, launching astronauts from American soil on American rockets. Um, so our partnership with SpaceX and our commercial partners, other commercial partners is critical and our international partners. Uh, we we could, could not do this without them. Uh, very international mission with two US astronauts and one from NISA and one from JAXA. And uh, obviously the ISS is the largest engineering collab international collaboration in, in the history of 